Uh, Alexi, I think it's your that says. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of work. Uh, okay, so I, I, I put my other hat. <laughs> uh, so let, let me no, because I, I thought just before that I would have one hour to prepare this uh, this moderation of session, but no, actually I have uh, less than one minute. Um, okay, so uh, I'm very happy to be the moderator of. Um, the 17th session of the Gamma Days. It's really impressive to say that. Uh, it's like uh, we have been together since one month uh, on participatory modeling and simulation. So the third one on this subject. And we have three uh, presentations of uh, 20 minutes uh, each. Uh, so one, the first one, it's supposed to be given by Leonard Iggy. Um, so, are you here, Leonard? I'm here. Yeah. Hello. Okay, okay, okay. Um, all right, so I can hear you. It's already very good. And maybe we can see your slides if you share your screen. We'll, we'll hold the presentation together with my colleagues, Gabriela and Diego. It's Gabriela who is going to share the slides. Okay. All right, so I let you, I see, I see them very well. So I let, uh, let you the floor, okay? okay. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Our contribution today addresses the use of gamma for participatory modeling. We have developed and tested tools based in gamma in urban planning processes of medium and small cities in the surroundings of Potsdam in the state of Brandenburg, Germany. The tools were developed within two research projects uh, at the University of Applied Science Potsdam. And in this presentation, we will give first an overview of the projects, first Basimo, then SmartUp Lab. And then uh, we will describe the challenges of using a gamma platform for participatory modeling in different application contexts, user roles, and purposes of use. Uh, my colleagues Leonard and Diego are modelers in each project. I uh, do research about knowledge transfer, but I have no modeling skills. And we are accompanied in our projects by a transdisciplinary teams with different backgrounds, such as uh, geoinformatics, futures research, social psychology, and sociology, among others. Both projects are connected in their approach, but differ in terms of topics and goals. And now Leonard will present us Project Passimo. Thank you, Gabriela, and hello, everybody, again. Passimo is a research project in which we've been developing a toolbox for participatory systems modeling for integrated urban development. Besides the model library and georeferenced survey tool, we set a focus on facilitating on-site participatory modeling with experts and stakeholders using Gamma. With its rather frugal approach, PASMO addresses especially small and mid-sized urban contexts and their challenges regarding urban development and transformation. This explains also our focus on case studies and small and mid-sized towns in the state of Brandenburg, Germany. We've tested Pasimo not only in an expert workshop on rental price control policies, but also have been conducting two case studies, one in different domains related to integrated district development in cooperation with the municipal housing company of Potsdam. And the other case study aims at investigating demographic scenarios in expert workshops for the small town of Fluckenwalde, Germany. Next slide, please. Yeah. I'm sorry, my... <laughs> so you'll be immediately yeah. seeing the <laughs> Cosmo toolbox right here uh, that comprises a growing library of simulation tools, uh, simulation models, sorry. Uh, an interactive presentation table that constitutes together with an e-bike and trailer, the mobile modeling lab, as well as geo, as the already mentioned here, reference survey tool and uh, serious games approaches. Conceit for being brought really to on-site modeling workshops in that bike trailer. 
Um, the, the interactive presentation table uh, we designed makes it possible to visualize gamma-based, agent-based models and have workshop participants interact with them, for example, to explore different scenarios. Yeah, I think, I don't know, in my screen, it's a bit cut on the lower bottom, Gabriela. If you put on uh, full screen mode on there. Yes. Thanks a lot. So conceived to co deliver a common basis for discussion, Pasmio can be integrated into a different process to science of deliberation and uh, decision making. And nevertheless, it should ideally represent, as you can see in the graphics, the idea of an iterative approach of model co-creation and adaption. The workshops conducted so far using gamma as modeling environment differed in their purposes of use of gamma and the roles of the participants involved. In our cooperation with the municipal housing company of the city of Potsdam, we used gamma, for example, in a possible approach for integrating data into a co-created model on integrated di district development, addressing different domains related to the transformation of the late GDR social housing district. We'll have a closer look here on the model of the district of Schwarz Potsdam that is part of our model library. The goal of this modeling approach was to communicate basic dependencies and influencing factors on residential mobility in the district, to gain insight into possible rental structures in 2035, and hence resulting district development approaches in the fields of mobility, demography, decarbonization, and population structure. As you can see in the center of the graphic, the model is based on core, and core dynamics of a local housing market matching offer and demand based on data of the municipal housing company, as well as implicit knowledge of the developing experts and common assumptions of the workshop participants on renter structure and district development mainly. You can see here amongst others, the CEOs of the municipal housing company and other local housing companies discussing development scenarios for the district on the, on the table. The process involved besides uh, the CEOs, also the company's experts, as well as related stakeholders, such as co-grading companies. The, co the process co-grading this model already showed important effects to us in terms of intra-organizational communication within the housing company, as well as with external stakeholders. But still, we also used it in other contexts, as we, as you can see here in this workshop, we conducted a toolbox test discussing hypothetical rental price control policies on a model of the small town of Eberswalde with stakeholders and experts. And we've been using gamma in this workshop, especially for visualizing a complex system and discussing different scenario outputs, as you can also see on the right, where we try to also um, communicate basic uh, model functions um, in a printed matter, actually. That's a typical situation of model discussion, at least before the pandemic, and model interaction around the presentation table. Uh, in general, and besides promising effects in terms of enhanced discussion and communication regarding complex transformation challenges, we experienced both promising abilities of gamma to service modeling environment, facilitating data integration and front end visualization, but also some challenges regarding intuitive model interaction for uses without modeling or gamma specific experience, which diminishes in the end stakeholder acceptance as well. Having faced questions regarding the integration of the passing approach into deliberation and decision making processes, the follow up project, smart applied focuses on the requirements and conditions to integrate participatory modeling into an urban planning process, which will be presented now by Gabriela and Diego. Thank you, Leonard. Um, so we describe now project the Smart Up Lab. And to make uh, urban planning sustainable, policy recommendations promote the creation of a common mission among all the actors of the city life. Strategies and implementations are based in this common vision. However, this mutual understanding is uh, in the actual planning is sometimes not uh, taking uh, place because of the complexity to reach this mutual understanding. 
So unlike mobility planning tools that simulate traffic foresight as uh, PTFR, Visum, Matsim, or Sumo, SmartTop Lab uh, provides a toolbox that supports the stakeholders in, this cre in the creation of this common vision. The toolbox integrates a geospatial city model at neighborhood level based on gamma and a set of transdisciplinary methods with the aim to foster the exchange of ideas among stakeholders. The project ends next year. So what we present here is a work in progress. And we hope the discussion today will help us to think further our research. And now uh, my colleague Diego D'Ameto will go deeper into our model. Yeah, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody else from my side. Um, since our goal is to test the introduction of participatory modeling in the current, in the actual planning practice, our first step has been to gather data from different sources into a single database. This is normally at local level, at least in Germany, in small towns, um, the first big challenge since no consistent data warehouse exists. And for this purpose, we use uh, open data provided by the city of Potsdam, as well as uh, open street data, but also data from public uh, transport provider. And we operationalize data from, from preliminary mobility researches in the Potsdam area. Uh, moreover, we conducted a gap analysis in order to identify relevant information that were missing and still could, uh, and still could be relevant for increasing the performance of our war model. Uh, for example, we estimated parking areas out of the topology and characterization of streets, as well as the capacity of buildings out of their volume and categorization. Uh, we used the iterative proportional fitting algorithm provided by the RMIPFP package for generating outdoors, and we developed a model choice model from a survey previously conduct conducted in the area. Um, our data um, warehouse is somehow a patchwork structure with data coming from different sources. Nonetheless, it should be taken into account that our main goal was uh, to persuade planners that main information are already available for a data-driven planning approach, even though those information are scattered through many databases and sources. And um, exactly. Um, so building on these um, data sources, we uh, defined a model addressing mobility issues in the region that is composed of three main pillars. Um, on the one side, on the left, we depicted the city infrastructure, especially the public transport uh, facilities, um, the buildings in the area and the other transport related infrastructure such as uh, the topology of the streets and traffic light and so on. Um, after that, we uh, developed, uh, we, we uh, modeled the available mobility service in the areas, the private uh, as well as the public um, transport, uh, meaning as well in, in cars and bikes in the area following researches that we conducted as well as um, the offer of bus and tramways and their schedule and so on. And uh, we also depicted the characteristic of the mobility demand uh, um, from a social demographic point of view, but also we considered the drive through traffic that um, could be an issue in this area following uh, planning developments. And building on this groundwork, we aim to combine it through our participatory method with expert knowledge and practitioner's experience in order to generate different city development and mobility concepts uh, that should be evaluated considering different transport and mobility indica indicators that we preliminary define it together with our stakeholder with a co-creational approach. As such, uh, we will focus now on the process, uh, although my colleagues uh, Gabriel will then talk about that, on the process that we attempt to develop for bringing participatory model into planning practice following uh, stakeholder needs and requirements. Thank you, Diego. Our participatory approach with early stakeholder engagement aims both to co-create the model and to apply the model in these collaborative situations. Therefore, we applied methods to gain uh, stakeholder perspectives and requirements 
And then we translated uh, those ideas and requirements into quantitative elements. Then we designed a workshop concept for the interaction and uh, where we try to uh, play these uh, insights of our partners and we expect to have as a result a comparison of scenarios. Uh, the project started at the same time as the lockdown. We had to adapt our methods to online environments. So our participatory approach can be addressed as a series of workshops uh, that take place along the sprints of the project. And after applying some traditional research methods, such as uh, expert interviews and literature reviews, uh, the first participative activities had a name to has as a name to perform uh, analysis of the current state and to visualize uh, stakeholder relevant issues. The first workshop took place in January this year. The stakeholders were presented with the tool according to the questions that we identified through the interviews and literature review, and then we received their feedback through a close questionnaire and a moderated discussion. As a result, we were able to refine our research question and identify this key issue that was uh, considered as relevant by our stakeholders to use with our tool. So um, the, subsequently, we created uh, so, uh, together the parameters for the scenario development. We perform a steep analysis, analysis and then with the stakeholders, researchers and modelers, uh, and we try to uh, make several rounds for a scenario conceptualization. The discussion was then uh, translated into three mobility concepts that went, were later operationalized uh, in Gamma. So now we are planning this last step in the last workshop round. The scenarios are to be played in the model uh, with a lower interaction level in comparison to Passimo. And the results uh, will be compared through a dashboard display. The aim of this workshop is to measure the effectiveness of the tool in relation to communication and social learning. Sorry. Uh, summing up our experiences in the context of participatory modeling and urban planning, we would like to describe the challenges of using Gamma within different contexts. Uh, maybe also already responding a bit uh, or in parts to Kevin's question in Slack. Um, we try to categorize relevant user groups, respective focus and desirable further developments. Assuming that we're not platform developers and we understand ourselves as model developers and transdisciplinary researchers in an applied research context, we see potential to enhance and extend the Gamma user community by facilitating the use of its features and its interoperability. So in our opinion, a differentiation of user roles and respective versions of the Gamma platform is uh, missing, except for the Gamma developer version. So Gamma with a user-centered interface and functionalities could support the use by stakeholders with limited modeling skills. In order to establish Gamma in the planning practice, it should be easily possible to integrate it with other data processing tools already in use. This is already the case with GIS-based tools, and that could be improved in our opinion in regard to documentation and data analysis uh, environments such as R and Python, for example. Especially in combination with the development of the Gamma Cloud, it would be desirable to provide stakeholders with a GUI adapted to their needs and with high graphical quality. I've seen already really impressive references like the Classbook model year, um, yesterday by the CityScope team presented by Jesus, for example. So we hope we could give you some insights from our participatory modeling practice using Gamma Platform and hope our suggestions can maybe contribute to extend further the possibilities of Gamma. We're looking forward to keeping in touch and sharing ideas always and also right now in the discussion after the other presentations. Thanks a lot and the three of us.
Okay, thank you very much. And it has been really, first, a really impressive presentation. I thank you a lot for participating and also very impressive that in a three voices uh, presentation, you, you have been able to respect the time, which is, a, <laughs> which is always a challenge. Uh, so thanks a lot. And we will move on uh, immediately. So uh, again, I, I remind people the, the question you can ask them in the chat or directly on Slack in the participatory modeling and simulation channel. Um, and then I will summarize them at the end and, and, and maybe give you the possibility to ask them directly if you, if you want. But we will have a, a question and answer session at the end of the session. Um, so now we have Christian Jara Figueroa, Figueroa so, sorry, um, uh, talking about gamma bricks and coupling gamma models with cityscope tables, which is uh, precisely something the last presenter just talked about. So Christian, are thank you, you, Alexis. You pronounced my name perfectly, by the way. I'm I'm really thankful. <laughs> for that. No, I, I don't believe one word what you say, but it's okay. No, no, really. I always get Jara. I'm like, okay, sure, <laughs> whatever. Uh, uh, good morning, cool. everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to hope that this works. Um, can it someone works. give me? Okay, perfect. Thank you. I need some, some auditive or visual feedback that things were working. Um, awesome. Fantastic. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me in this, in this conference. Thank you for putting it together as well. And thank you and, and thanks to everyone who has participated in this event. Um, really excited to talk about some of the work we've been doing at the City Science Lab and who we're using Gamma to build models that can be used for decision-making, something that the previous presenters already talked about. Uh, this work is done in collaboration with Arnaud Grignard, who I think some of you guys here know. Uh, I think he's somewhat known in this community and Ariel Neumann from MIT. So during this conference, we've seen a lot of very complex models of urban environments. And what I'm going to discuss in this presentation is what happens after. What happens after we build the behavior of the agents, after we calibrated the model, and after even we validated the model, Basically, the question is, how do we use this model? What is the use of this model? So during the last seven plus years, we've been thinking a lot about these questions at the City Science Group at MIT. And our approach is that a good use of these highly technical and very precise models of urban environment is as a decision-making tool. This is exactly the, the use that Leonard, Gabriela, and Diego talked about in the previous presentation. So we, we know all the, this idea that all models are wrong, but that some are useful. Uh, but we also recognize that identifying the usefulness of a model is not trivial. Uh, so the core theoretical argument behind a lot of the work we've been doing on our group is that if we let different stakeholders explore these models, these models can help break the information asymmetry that has led to the traditional top-down approach to urban planning. So what I'm saying is basically something that a lot of the presenters in this session know is that there's an opportunity here. There's a big use here and when we say, all models are around, but some are useful. There's an asterisk in the useful part because what does it mean for it to be useful? Like, what are we going to use it for? Uh, so, for a lot of policymakers and researchers, of course, this, this idea is not new. Our contribution here is that we develop, we're trying to develop a flexible framework that allows policymakers, researchers, and other stakeholders to execute on that application and to start testing to see if this approach is in fact useful. And that framework includes Gamma as part of the ecosystem. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So let, let's talk about a little bit about this old model of program planning that I was referring to, or like, as we call it like planning by decree. Uh, this top-down model tends to be slow and bureaucratic, uh, tends to equate participation to tokenism because the more people you include in the design process, the more complicated it becomes to create a shared perspective. Uh, so you end up with these design echo chambers where Frank Gehry gives the finger to a journalist where architects end up building monuments instead of liberal spaces. And, and let me be clear, this old model works. We have designed and built cities for centuries using this model. This model solves a big challenge that you need a lot of prior knowledge and expertise to even think about planning a city. The planner typically studies for years to get to the point where they can look at the city from above. So th this model works is useful because it solves a challenge. But we think there's a better way. We think that you can flip this model by building the right tools for urban planning that can help bridge that knowledge gap and by they taking those tools and putting them in the hands of people. And this is the spirit behind CSCOP and I'm guessing the spirit behind a lot of the other presenters in this session. Um, so this new model we've been working on uses existing technologies for urban planning 
and puts them in the, hand of all, in the hands of all stakeholders. So in simple terms, what we do is take all these models of urban environments uh, and display them around a table made of Legos, uh, such that everyone can change the landscape and see how the model reacts to it. So how this model works, usually have an interactive area in a table. The table can either be a physical table or a digital one. And users are expected to change certain aspects of the urban environment. And they're going to see how, uh, how the models react to that. So the, the information projected on the table changes depends on the needs of the community. And the table is usually coupled with a series of descriptive analytics that help make sense of the complexity of the models that, that we're using. So you can think about a community that's really interested in decreasing traffic. Uh, and they're thinking about there's a tension between developers that want to build high rises, uh, communities, uh, community members that don't want the high rises there, but they realize that actually high rises help decrease traffic because suddenly you don't have to commute from the suburbs to the downtown area. So the model can help you understand that. And by the community members realizing that actually they care about traffic as well as they care about sunlight, they can find that trade, they, they can identify that trade off and find that sweet spot where most of the needs of the community and the stakeholders are met. Um, so this framework is general enough that tries to hit that sweet spot between being general enough to allow for multiple applications and specific enough that it won't overwhelm users. And, and this is the challenge here, that we want this framework to be flexible enough so that we can generalize it and amplify it to any place in the world, but specific enough such that we don't use the, uh, the, the local knowledge that is necessary for a lot of these environments. So some of my colleagues have been extensively testing this approach. And if you're interest, interested in all the applications that we have developed in the past few years, let me know and I'd be happy to direct you to some relevant projects. I won't be talking about them today. Uh, well, I'll be talking about uh, how do we couple Gamma with this framework. Uh, before we dive into the framework and how Gamma fits within it, I wanna briefly touch though upon one success story of this participatory model for urban planning, which is perhaps my favorite application of this tool, my favorite success story of it. And some of you might know this, uh, in June 2015, our team signed an agreement with the city of Hamburg to help them design the Olympic Village, a beautiful and ambitious first world problem. In August of that same year, the refugee crisis broke out in Europe and suddenly the Hamburg Olympic 2024 seemed like a waste of money. So the team in Hamburg together with our team at MIT redirected all of our efforts working alongside our, our Hamburg colleagues to design a series of workshops where Hamburg residents aided by city scope tables, were able to find homes for 23,000 immigrants. So this is actually a, a really interesting story because it shows you how uh, this participatory planning can actually have an effect. And all we're doing is telling them, this is what the policymaker thinks. These are the models that they're working on. We're putting them on the table for you to understand it. Uh, so by, by now, at this point in the presentation, it should be very obvious that Gamma fits within this model. And since 2016, when Arnaud joined the lab, we have actually been using Gamma as part of the tools in our toolkit. And, and since Arnaud is an experienced Gamma developer, coupling Gamma to Cityscope was fairly straightforward to him. But the challenge then is to open up the ecosystem such that any Gamma developer can couple their model to a Cityscope project. That is the challenge we're trying to solve here. Um, normally, I would now talk about Gamma. But since this community is very versed on this tool, I will skip it for now and describe the details of the Cityscope architecture. I will assume that everyone knows uh, what Gamma is. And, and if you don't, you probably opened the wrong Zoom link. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what, what Cityscope projects are so that we understand how do we couple Gamma models with it. So uh, Cityscope relies on this idea of a table. A table is a Cityscope project, basically. Table and project are, are equal to us in the language of Cityscope. When created, each project relies on a server that we have developed to handle the communication between different models for urban planning and different types of visualization. Uh, what you're seeing right now is how a table looks like using our front end build using JavaScript. The different layers you're seeing are being posted to the CDIO server based on the special analytics right into a different server. So we call these layers of information indicators. So an indicator in general terms is any measurable aspect of an urban ecosystem. In other words, an indicator is any function of our urban ecosystem that returns information in any format possible. And when we bring it down from this general concept of indicator to the application of the Cityscope table, we just replaced the urban uh, environment, urban ecosystem by Cityscope Create. So we're again, 
building a simplified model of, of, of the world as we are used to doing in this community. And when applied to Cisco, the indicator becomes a function not of the urban ecosystem, but of the grid that users will then edit. So this grid usually represents the part of the city that is being developed. Users are expected to make changes to the grid, see how these changes affect different characters of the city, and then make decisions based on that. So an indicator is expected to map the state of the grid to those expected city characteristics. How much will traffic increase? How much will diversity increase? How much will uh, the total light that people get will increase? Uh, what are the sunshine, where are the sunshine areas? How will proximity to parks change? I'm sorry, I need to drink coffee, it's really early here. Um, so this is how the city of architecture looks like. Uh, all the links in pink show different ways in which the user can edit the grid. And, and this is agnostic. So the, the grid exists in the server. It can be edited in, in, in any variety of different ways. Uh, any edit to the grid will be reflected in the CDIO server. Changes in the server will welcome the modules that will post indicators to CDIO. Those are the light blue lines. And finally, the green lines on the right-hand side represent the different ways that you can visualize the information posted to CDIO. You can project on a table, a web browser, an iPad, etc. Uh, and what I want to highlight here is that this ecosystem is actually a multi-tool ecosystem. So the use of CDI, the CDO server in the middle, allows for users to build models in virtually any programming language that they're interested in. So you can have users building on Python, in R, Gamma, uh, Grasshopper, which is something that architects like using a lot. Uh, so the part that we're concerned with right now is this part, the part that communicates modules, models of urban planning, with the CDIO server, and how do we make that communication a little bit easier and straightforward? Because what we want is we want architects and urban planners and, and uh, transportation engineers to focus on what it is they do best, which is building models. So if you're an agent-based modeler and you want to build an agent-based model for a city, we want you to focus on that. We don't want you to focus on how you're going to display it on the table, how you're going to connect to CIO server, etc. So this is why we developed this, this tool that we're calling Gamma Bricks. So Gamma Bricks, Couples gamma with Cityscope, that's, that's a simple thing it does. Um, a lot of these statements are actually hopeful. We are working on this, this is work in progress. So uh, when I say easy to use, there's a we hope associated to it. Uh, what this, this does do though, is that it handles post and get requests between the server and, and a gamma project model running on your computer. Uh, it, it should also be backwards compatible in the sense that if there's ever an update push on the CDIO server, some important API changes, your project built with Gamma Brick should stay current and you should be able to use it regardless because we will get update Gamma Brick accordingly. Um, so to make it easier for Gamma users to use, uh, the, to use Cityscope, we went ahead and translated the famous road traffic tutorial to work with Cityscope. So I, I'm guessing that any, anyone who has uh, written a line in Gamma knows the left-hand side figure because it's the introductory uh, tutorial that most of us go through. So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is to show you how we go from a city scope table with both industrial and the residential cells in the grid all the way uh, and connect that to a, to, to a gamma project. Uh, so it's five simple steps. Step zero, you create a table. Uh, we develop a simple web app that will allow you to create a new table. Anytime a table is created, it will generate a new grid in the designated area. Each cell has a color, a height and ID, and most importantly, it has a type. The type in this example is either industrial or residential, but the type is meant to capture what uh, the characteristics of the environment are important for the decision-making process. So if you're thinking, for example, about diversity, uh, you're thinking about immigrants and refugees, you might be wondering about uh, the number of available housing units each one of these cells has. So the type will correspond to a number of available housing units and you can edit that and you can move that around. Uh, step one. Bring your grid to Gamma. That's the step one. So you open up your Gamma platform. You, you want to have your grid on, on Gamma. And with that simple block of code on the left, what it's doing is that it's allowing you, allow you to bring and create the replicate in the Gamma world, the city scope world. Uh, so the code on the left is all you need really to create a Gamma world that has like, the grid. Uh, the grid cells are instantiated as agents that belong to the brick species. And what is important here is that this is not just static. So your model will respond to any changes someone does in the front end. 
So let's say, for example, I am working locally with Gamma by computer and our noise in France and he decides to make an update and change one of the residential cells for in the industrial cells that will be reflected on my uh, Gamma platform that I'm working on right now. This is done such that in every few cycles, the model will check if the grid hash has changed or not. If it has changed, the model will update the new grid. If it hasn't, it will leave it alone. Step two, place people in residential cells. So this is, a, this is very straightforward. And if you have ever completed the road traffic tutorial, you realize that all you do is change the building species for the brick species here, because you're not dealing with build, buildings anymore. You're dealing with these cells in the city scope uh, table. Step three, movement of people. This is as before, this is very similar to the original road traffic tutorial where you're just asking people to move between the residential and industrial cells and you're giving them some time that they go to work and some time, uh, some time that they go back home. Step four, post into CDAO. And this is where things start to diverge a little bit. When it comes to agents, CDAO is expecting an object that has all the positions of agents for a whole day of simulation. So this means that Gamma Bricks implements a listen mode. When in listen mode, Gamma Bricks will run the simulation for one whole day and then post all of that like a movie to CDIO. After it posts, it will remain idle, waiting for changes to the grid. When a change to the grid is recorded, Gamma Bricks will wake up the agents and simulate another day to post it again to CDIO with a new configuration of the grid. So let's, let's look at an example. Uh, and I did not dare to do it live. So this is, uh, this, the simulation is running, you see people are going from home to work and now Gamma is on idle mode waiting for any change to the grid. And if you wanna run this locally on your computer, you can just go ahead and check our tutorial, uh, copy and paste that step and you'll be able to see what's going on. You'll be able to see actually that this movement of agents is actually posted in the front end. So, so okay, final step, step five, add indicators. So if you look at any CDX scope projects on the right hand side, the front end has a space for a radar plot, bar chart, and in theory has space to add more different kinds of uh, descriptive statistics. Uh, so in Gamma, these values are expected to be created as observers in the Gamma world. So the way that you build them is that you create an agent that is an observer that will report some information and then you give it some properties to communicate back to CIO. I don't wanna go into details right now, but this is how, uh, the should be a video. Okay, it's not. A video. Um, this the video was missing. I think. There we go. I'm sorry about that. This is the video was missing. So this is how the agents look like, and it's the exact same simulation that people are going from home to work, and now if you wait for a little bit, there we go. They're going back home now later in the day. So this is running from uh, my computer in this case. For, uh, post it onto the CEO server. Um, if you ever come by our lab, you're gonna see, uh, you're gonna see how, how this model looks like when projected to a Lego table. And this is, I think, what uh, Leonard actually mentioned about the, what is interesting about the oscilloscope uh, front end is that you can actually see it on a physical table. And, and, and my colleagues have done extensive research about how exactly the physicality of the space that you're dealing with changes the way that you make decisions and how actually it's, it's a little bit more powerful than just a screen. Uh, so what is interesting about this is that the fact that you have this framework, you have the CDIO server in the middle, you have different tools, post information to it, and then you can visualize in different ways. One of them being a web browser, one of them being a table, an information project on a table, is actually quite quite powerful. Um, so this is the exact same model. This is proximity to work, proximity to residential, and you can project it on the table. So finally, I want to end with this slide. I want to invite you guys, come talk to us, come work with us, come collaborate with us. This is very much a work in progress. Uh, this is very much open source. Uh, we would like to have more people using the tool, uh, using Gamma, using uh, the Python library that we have developed for the same purpose, using CDIO. The server is open for anyone to create tables. Uh, there's some data usage limit so that we, our build doesn't run uh, wild, but feel free to use it as well. Uh, so far, we have two, taught two workshops onboarding students to the CDS code process. The most interesting one for me was the one that we taught in 2020, where we taught a workshop in Israel to 20 architecture students with very little programming experience. And what I like about this workshop is by the end of it, they were able to identify a research question. Some of them were actually quite interesting relating to diversity. Yes, there was one team that tackled a research question in Jerusalem. That was a whole, a whole world to, to, to explore. Uh, they were able to identify a question 
and build a model to tackle the question and then connect that model to a table in the front end. Um, and with that, I think I'm, I'm actually arriving in time. Look at that, perfectly on time. Thank you so much for your attention and I hope to see you guys on GitHub or on Slack. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, Sara. It was a very, very nice presentation also. And uh, I'm so happy to be moderator of a session with incredible presentations. I see there are already a lot of questions, but we are going to move to the next presentation in order to close the, the presentations and have a nice uh, uh, question answer session. So the last one is multi-agent system applied to hydric resources. A comparison between Gamma and Google Earth by Miriam Bourne. So Miriam, I saw you, I think you're here. You're muted. So you, you need to unmute your, your mic. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, no, no problem. Hello. And I let you the floor. You have 20 minutes to present your work. And hello, my name is Miriam. I will present multi-agent systems applied to hydro research, a comparison between Gamma and Google Earth. Next. This is a natural resource management. Uh, the management of natural resource, especially is water resource, becomes increasingly in, in, in your society. These multi-agent systems is aspect important of the work. Some agents interact in every environment, models of social and environment systems. The agents consider two behaviors, an individual or collective. Cooperation, coordination, competition, and negotiation is important for the, the agents. Advantages, fast resolution, flexibility, and scalability, increasing responsiveness. Uh, BDA architecture believe the series and intention is important uh, aspects is aspects important in multi agent systems. The objective of the work main goal set a comparison between the functionalities of the Gamma and Google Earth Engine platforms, specific objectives identify and assess which platform is most suitable in the context of the data analysis on other systems, evaluate the variable of the georeference data for the which tool, analyze of the feasibility to use multi-agent seats in each tool, the development in, study case, uh, in case study of the booth platform using database of the Lagoa Meeting Watershed and San Gonzalo channel. Google Earth Engine, this uh, uh, feature is, is a platform, uh, cloud-based geospatial, geospatial that process platforms, make a large amount of geographic data viable from the Google service, Par parallel process to perform the calculate on the large number of machines, program language of the Google Earth, JavaScript, Python, and JavaScript, free available for a code data for open source use. This uh, feature is important. This uh, picture represents this uh, a main interface of the Google en Engine, Google Earth. This is uh, represent information from hydro, uh, information uh, hydrograph, the watershed in Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. Gama is a platform uh, comparison. This uh, agent-based modeling attitude, development model and simulation in the, the platform is, is important for, uh, for work. Based on the Eclipse, modeling of the emergent system is, is uh, good uh, 
aspects in the, the work possibility to integrate and manipulate data from geographic informative systems, interface helping organizing and viewing models, models, and program language, uh, Java and Gamal, the Gamma modeling language specific of the, the uh, Gamma platform, uh, development by UNESCO, ERD, and UPMC. This is a picture represent the work, uh, the, the work, the Gama. This is a Lagoa Mirim, uh, in, uh, Lagoa Mirim Watershed in uh, São Gonçalo Canal. This is a platform. This interface corresponds uh, to work carried out on the Gama workshop. Uh, at UNB Brasilia, Brazil, this, this work representing the project development in the, the workshop. The computers in, in two uh, platforms is uh, aspect, important aspects uh, evaluated. Available of the georeferent data on the platform is to correspond, is to OK. Integrate of georeference in information on the platform is Google Earth is okay, is Gamma not. Manipulation of the georeference information, these two platforms, it's okay. Integration of the multi HD systems in the Gamma is a very good, is uh, a correct thing, it's a future, is, is G is not. Program language use. On the platform, uh, Google Earth, JavaScript, and Python, and Gamma, Java, and Gamal. Easy of use the platform interface is to, it's okay. Use the platform in the context of uh, natural research is okay too. Platform integration with other tools, it's okay. Process large uh, volume of data. Gamma is, is, is not a, a large volume. The, the data. This process small volume of the data is to it's okay. Is a important aspect the comparison in, in the two platforms in the, in the work. Conclusions in the, of the work. This work tries to evaluate the two tools development, develop uh, multi-agent simulation to participatory management of the other resource. Main contribution in the, this work established as a comparison that between the functionalities of the Gamma and Google Earth platforms and two possibilities and options. Identify an evaluation with which uh, two is the best suite on the context, the data analyzed on the other resource. Analyze the data available, available provide by which one and we saw the analysis the possibility of integrate them. Uh, discontinuing, the two platform provide integration of georeference data systems in the area of the water resource. Literature review in research of the work that related the uh, Google Earth platform which water research and multi systems model of hydraulic basin from the database of the Rio Grande do Sul in the Gama and uh, Google Earth platforms and possibilities and future works of the, the, the work integrate page into uh, Google Earth platforms conducting an interface and, and functional test and adapt the future on the selecting the platforms, select your for uh, the work. And technologies, Ana, Capis, FURG and UFPEL. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So I, actually you, you had, if I'm not completely wrong, you had 20 minutes to present your work. Uh, you only use 10, <laughs> which is uh, even more impressive than the ones uh, perfectly on time. Uh, 
Um, so thank you very much. I so there, there are a number of questions about your different presentations. Obviously, more for the two first ones because people have time to think think about it. So what I I will do, I will ask you directly, Miriam, one question, and then we, we move back in time to, to see the, the, the question for the others. Um, so my, my question is really, what, what was your motivation behind this comparison? Because for me, it's, it's a really strange comparison. Uh, I can understand that, well, it might make sense sometimes, but it, it's quite strange to compare um, uh, a platform used to build models normally and um, uh, yeah, a platform uh, we, which is uh, really dedicated to geospatial information. Uh, so what, what was the, the motivation behind? Uh, what what did, did you want to do that you could not do with other tools? And this uh, comparison carry out uh, in this work had the objective analyze the the platforms will be most uh, uh, suitable in the context of this because of the project. In the I I I study uh, in this uh, hydrograph uh, hydrograph basin and Lagoa Medin and Channel São Gonçalo. Uh, we can see the comparison the two platforms. The gamma uh, is very good uh, choice because is a um, is a Arari has multi agent modeling multi agent systems is very good for the the project, uh, but in the large volume is a gamma is uh, is small slowing uh, is. A, Google uh, Earth is a is a very good in the in the aspects, but uh, uh, Gamma is is a uh, already uh, uh, the emulsion systems is very good uh, because not uh, necessary e integrate is is model model different in the in the platform is a uh, is a very good for for the project yeah yeah uh, i'm sorry uh, i'm diana damati uh, i'm working with uh, if uh, i can talk about uh, the idea uh, because i use gamma because uh, our project uses agents uh, i can't um, open my camera i don't know the problem i'm sorry i tried uh but uh you try you, you can use gamma but you, you have a lot of uh, special data and oh, okay camera opens now uh and uh, uh the the gamma is very uh long uh slow to to work uh delay a lot a lot of time and uh uh, Google engine is fast working the cloud, and uh, you try to configure agents in Google engine, but uh, it's very hard because uh, the tool is not uh, defined to work with agents. And uh, you try compare uh, to tools to to understand with better or how to integrate this just these two tools uh, together. This is uh, the idea of this work. Okay, thank you very much for the explanations. So I will, I will <laughs> go back a little bit in time. Um, there, there was uh, actually several questions to, to both presentations, uh, Cityscope and uh, pa Passimo, I think. Sorry, I don't remember, uh, Passimo team. Um, <laughs> and uh, actually there, um, Patrick Taillandier had almost the same question for the two teams, which is, I think, uh, an interesting question. So I will ask it and then feel free to, to answer uh, either for if you're coming from Germany or uh, uh, the US. Um, so the, the question is, when you present your um, models and uh, your tables and all the technology which is, uh, we, we, which is present here, how do you present the models inside? 
I mean, do you explain what, how it is running inside? Do you explain the mechanisms? Do you explain uh, what, an, I don't know, maybe what an agent-based model, model here is? So what, what is the level of uh, comprehension or maybe uh, knowledge you provide the users with so that maybe they can, they can participate also to, I don't know, the co-design of the models or, so I don't know who wants to answer first. So I, I can I can go first. I was actually just, okay. uh, hi Patrick, I was actually answering Patrick on, on Slack and then I stopped myself on my tracks. So I was like, wait, I, I, I can say this faster than I can type it. Uh, so my experience presenting these models to non-scientists is that they, they love it. So on one hand, Agent-based models are very easy to understand if you can explore them. So if you can change the parameters and see how the model reacts, it's really easy to understand. So what I've seen people do is that, for example, they, if like the model involves housing density, they increase the density all the way up. So they go to the corner cases and they see that extreme variation in the model and they're like, oh, I understand, right? If I increase housing density, I'm increasing foot traffic. That's great. Uh, if I'm increasing, I'm lowering density and decreasing traffic. Okay, I understand it now. It's, it's easy. They rarely ask about the assumptions that you're making for the models. And this is the part where actually policymakers, when they see these kind of things, they love it because the comment I've gotten is that they, they look at the table and they see this is a blueprint on steroids in the sense that a policymaker usually makes a lot of assumptions to get to a final proposal. And those assumptions are lost. No one, like, for example, they will assume that I'm gonna place a park here because I'm assuming that this residential unit is gonna increase in density in the next 10 years. And then they don't get to explain that, they really get to explain that to the community. Because also it's technical, it's difficult to understand like there's projections, there's stuff like that. Uh, but if you put it on a model on a table and you ask the person to remove the park and then you have an indicator on the side that shows you like proximity to parks and you see the dropping, you're like, oh, okay. I see that the park there is because I want people in this area to have access to a park. So in that sense, they see it as a blueprint in a stereo, so they can, the users can explore it and they can understand the assumptions and the trade-offs that were being taken in order to arrive to the proposed plan. Okay, thank you. Anyone from Passimo team wanting to intervene? Leonardo? Yes, but maybe we, can, we could both answer as we are two projects with a different, slightly different approach. So speaking for Passimo, actually we're I already answered and like tried to outline a bit. Um, we're trying to use graphics first to explain basic uh, basic principles of the models, as we've been showing in the slides, which does not um, which is not a flowchart of the ODD, but really a right, a simplified um, really simplified flowchart and um, have a basic introduction into what is AVM because often we have a hard time also referring to this round table. Um, this noon, a uh, hard time explaining that ABM uh, micro simulation is not uh, really linked to big data or does not really rely on a lot of data um, involved. And uh, then, yeah, according a bit to the expert level or um, the stakeholder roles actually um, go deeper or not. And But this is really a point where we are still struggling, finding a good solution also where um, wondering currently whether we could implement kind of a change log or so, because as you've seen like this iterative characteristic of the participatory process um, should actually make tra more transparent the, the changes made to the model due to the involvement of the stakeholders and their assumptions, as you also said, Christian. And uh, also often it's pretty easy to translate assumptions into sliders in the GUI um, sometimes. Uh, as you can discuss about sliders and uh, changes there, but when it uh, yeah, when it comes to basic basic principles, it gets harder. Gabriela, how are you doing this? Yeah, yes. Gabriela. Uh, well, I will be short uh, to add to what the colleagues just said. We also try to implement uh, some sort of methods to. Um, manage the stakeholder expectations so we build upon what the stakeholders already want or expect to get from this participatory situation so that we address uh, what what they need what they want or what we cannot provide according to what they expect and that helps us 
for them to get more active in the exchange and to fully understand uh, what can be done or what is that we are actually trying to achieve. I, I have a funny story. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to one-up you, Patrick. Uh, I'm going to talk about how kids react to this. Uh, so we had a workshop a few uh, months ago where we brought a bunch of, it was 28-year-olds to the lab and have them playing with our tables. And we were very proud because we thought our tables were very robust. You know, like people have played with them, they hadn't broken them. They broke it within like two minutes. Um, yeah, they, they loved it. They were really excited with it. They, they saw it as a computer game. And of course they started moving the knobs in all, all directions. And then suddenly the knob broke. And we're like, okay, <laughs> I guess it's not as robust as we thought. Yeah, okay. Um, so again, an another question by, uh, I think it's, Kevin, um, because wh what was interesting, at, at least for um, for Gamma developers or people who, who were in charge of developing parts of Gamma, is to see that wh what we saw at the beginning and what maybe we designed at the beginning as a kind of uh, a little bit closed tool. Okay, like uh, like um, like the examples we had at the beginning, like NetLogo or anything, we, which were cl quite closed actually. Uh, with their own language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it's wh what was really interesting in these um, first two presentations, and also in the last one by the comparison with uh, uh, we, we, with uh, Google Earth, is to to finally fi find out that you were using Gamma as part of an ecosystem of tools. So there, there are many, many, many different tools doing different things, uh, specialized in different uh, aspects, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and um, the question of uh, of Kevin is um, what what uh, for, he was uh, specifically addressing the Passimo team regarding the da data management because you have a lot of pre-processing of data before uh, feeding the simulations actually and the question was uh, are there things that you think in your ecosystem should be integrated into Gamma or is it okay like this? I mean, is it okay for you to use it as a, a, a one of the pieces of a puzzle uh, that you that you build and maintain, etc., knowing that sometimes it's compli it's complicated and perhaps very complex to maintain uh, a, a network of softwares. Okay, so um, I don't know who wants to answer about this, Leonard. I think. Diego just dropped in. Can you hear us? I don't know because you would be the expert for the R language. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I was uh, um, in another meeting. Uh, the, the question was the, the first one from of Kevin about maintaining the, such an environment, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be honest, although from our perspective and keeping in count that we are not um, professional um, software developer, we attempted to create a, a full um, gamma environment um, that it worked, meaning that we wanted to do all data preprocessing in gamma, but we wanted to connect gamma to other services like QGIS and R, and particularly from the point of view that if the goal is to bring gamma somehow to, to practitioners, to people that have also limited um, skills from, from programming skills and so on, uh, it would be great to, um, to couple it with, with software that are already used in the sector. So for example, QGIS, it's already a, very diffuse already by, by, by planners and so. Um, and that was the way that we thought it could be the, um, the best way from, for, for us. So using Gamma somehow as an IBM engineer um, but for example, um, not necessarily uh, we want to, 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 to teach planners to use gamma, but how can they use some model in that we develop in gamma and then visualize those results, for example, in QGIS, that's an environment that they know much better and that they have confidence on. So th that was our, our plan. It works somehow as of some, for something, it's a little bit, uh, yeah, it's not a full complete pipeline, but this was our vision, I would like to say. 
I, I might add here also um, on the on the front end for in the user perspective, uh, talking about tables and interacting with models for um, stakeholders that are not used to gamma. Um, we're really like I'm impressed, for example, by the by the work um, Jesus presented yesterday as well. But that means also a lot of work before setting up a map tile server and so on. Um, this would be also for us a thing really to implement in Gamma more, where we, we try to stay in Gamma here on the front end for the table, but um, try to find workarounds like implementing buttons and menus as species um, so you can interact in the, in the map by, with just one touch. Um, and yeah, actually also um, to, to underline what Diego said, we already tried to teach actually the the experts of the municipal housing companies um, working with their model in Gamma um, for their use and also invited um, the, the employees of the municipal administration of the uh, urban planning department to our Gamma teaching course at universities. So we, we could imagine actually here really to extend the user group of Gamma because in the end, we, uh, we have corporations of one to two years um, have an output and we'd like to um, keep them continuing uh, using the models and working with it. Christian, maybe you want to say something about... Yeah, so I, I think there's also like a, an interesting tension here to explore because on, on one hand, it is more efficient to use one language for everything. But on the other hand, if you're trying to open it up and not make it open source, then you're basically asking people that in order to participate in your open source project, they need to learn a programming language. Uh, so that's why the approach that we've been taking is a little bit um, try, like we push for the ecosystem, we push for the diversity of programming languages, diversity of tools, because we find it a little bit easier for people to onboard themselves that way. So just to give an example in the workshop we talked in Israel that I referred to in the presentation, we had architects. And when you show an architect, you say, hey, you can do this in Python or you can do it in Gamma. They all flock to Gamma because it's more intuitive. They, they can understand agents. They can understand giving the behavior. They can see what's going on. So we don't want to tell them you have to use one or the other uh, because we do want them to collaborate in the open source projects. So it's interesting because, but there's, there's a tension there as well. Uh, what we saw that ended up happening in terms of data is that there was usually one person in the team that was the more data savvy person. They did all the data processing, all the Data, data management, and then the other team was actually focused on building the model on Gamma. So it's like there's a little bit of specialization for people that comes also with a specialization of different tools that they're using for the tasks that they have. Okay, thanks. It's quite clear, and I, I I do share actually with with both your teams. I, I really do share the this. Um, the, the balance to observe between having only one and one one only one tool to, to do everything from A to Z, and, um, and and the problem that may that may arise from it because uh, if you if you force people to use only one uh, vision and one way to represent the world, I think uh, in, you you are maybe maybe influencing them too much. One question I had, which, which is connected, so it's not a question in, in this, but it's really connected to what you say, um, the both, both teams said, is that by multiplying the technologies and, and, and the links between technologies, and so in a way, the complexity and fragility of your, of your systems, I, I feel that maybe, I don't know, but I feel that it may be more complicated. Sorry, there, there is a storm coming in, in Hanoi. <laughs> So maybe maybe there will be some noise behind me, but I feel that it may be more complicated um, for uh, end users, okay, participants, to become autonomous in uh, using these tools. So that you will always be uh, necessary, okay, in the loop, so that people will have to resort to uh, I don't know, uh, Cityscope team or uh, Passimo team, etc whenever they want to do something. Because, uh, and, and we felt the same, um, uh, the same, the same problem when we, with Patrick, for example, when we, we made some choice between what, what should be in Gamma and what shouldn't be in Gamma. 
there are many things in gamma already. And sometimes we put things inside because we felt that if we didn't do it, people would have to ask us again and again and again. I don't know how to clean the network of roads or how to, by putting a model and some algorithm inside which would do it, uh, then uh, in a way they become autonomous, they can become autonomous. So do, do you feel the same uh, tension because between your role and actually the autonomy people should have at some point in using this kind of, uh, this kind of tools? Yeah, that, that's interesting that you asked that. Uh, I 100% agree with that, that there's, there's that tension definitely. And um, the way that when we've been trying to, we've been making efforts towards moving more towards autonomy and the, for example, the development of this Kama Bricks tool, the development of the analogous Bricks tools for Python, uh, the, the writing a lot of documentation for this is, is in that spirit. It's in the spirit that, uh, so right now I, I told the story and I was very uh, upfront with that, that when I not joined the lab, if you wanted to connect a Gamma model to a TC Discord table, you asked or no. Uh, right now you will read the tutorial. So the, there is a step in that direction. Uh, but I, I don't think we're there yet. And, and there's definitely that trade of that. Yeah, you have a bottleneck. The bottleneck right now is, in our case, the CDO server. Uh, so whenever there's an important workshop that uh, is being taught, there has to be someone making sure that that doesn't crash. So we, we kind of like diminish complexity by loading this one server in the middle, which is smaller complexity, but it relies a lot on that. So it's less, the system is less resilient. And that's, that's the trade off that we had to take at some point. Anyone from Passimo or regarding the autonomy of end users? I think we're also absolutely with you here. Um, uh, like, I think end users, in our in our opinion, comprises um, employees from uh, local local urban development administration as well as uh, maybe researchers without really a modeling experience. Um, but definitely for us, it's also important to um, strengthen the autonomy and hence to integrate rather functionalities so to empower them to use models keep keep using models themselves and actually as we see our role often with stakeholders rather to um, assist in finding the research research question shaping the concept of the model discussing the concept of the model but not um, interacting with the model in the end long term Okay, um, there was one question, we, so we have a few minutes left for questions, and th there was one question which, which I find uh, really important in, in this kind of um, interactive uh, modeling and simulation uh, approaches, which is a question of scale. Uh, the scale of phenomena, the scale of um, spatial, um, spatial parcels that Actually, wait, uh, uh, f first question is, is there a limit to the scale of uh, phenomena you, 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 can, um, uh, you can explore with people in, in, in that way? Okay, so is there, I don't know, an upper limit? Mm -hmm. So you, you, you can't expect having people, I don't know, reasoning about uh, uh, an entire country uh, using this kind of table. Uh, so is there a, a kind of ideal scale? And once you have reached this ideal scale with, with people, depending on your problem, um, how do you deal with the bonding conditions or edge problems? I mean, uh, because these uh, small parcel will be part of something. If you're talking about mobility, for example, on a, in an area, um, you, you are part of a city. And this city, the, 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 in, the incoming mobility will have an influence, of course but also the choices you will make in your uh, district, for example, will also have an influence on the, on the whole city. So how do you deal with, on one hand, uh, so do, do you have some preferred scale, okay, things you think are the, the right scale for this kind of uh, experiments? And uh, also how do you deal with bonding conditions? I, 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 can go, yeah, <laughs> I can go first. So um, this is a little bit less about the architecture of the system and more about, uh, I think it's more about the way that you build the model. And uh, agent based models have this advantage that you actually, the granularity of the simulation is very 
very, very small, right? You can look at agents moving around. But at some point you run into the issue that if you want to simulate an entire city, you need to make abstractions and you need to make it a little bit more coarse. And so I, I don't think it's that much of a question about like the technical capacity of the like server that you're using. I think it's more of a question of like, what exactly are you interested in simulating and how, what trade-offs are you willing to take to make it a little bit more coarse and to simulate the standard conditions? So just to give an example, I think it was Ariel and Ronan that developed a mobility choice model where instead of, so our group deals a lot with the district scale because that's what most people care about and that's where a lot of developments happen. So you're thinking about developing, you know, a new residential area is, is never the whole city, right? It's always a district scale. So you develop a new district. So this is where we tend to focus on our, our, our efforts. So what they have done, for example, is that they just create a box around it and they simulate, they add border conditions to the problem and then they simulate the edges inside. So instead of simulating the commute all the way from the suburbs to downtown area, you just generate the agents in the edge of it, uh, depending on some data that you have created. So I, I, that, that's one approach of, of doing it. Then the other question was uh, relating to like this scale. Right? Like, I think you already answered, right? Like that uh, we're thinking about this district scale because that's a lot of where planning happens. Uh, now, I, th I think the question is really on point in the sense that any changes that you make to the district will also affect the city at large. Uh, and that is actually, I think it's, it's like fairly difficult to tackle in general. And there's, there's one project that does that uh, in our lab at least, uh, where they, they're thinking about redeveloping an area around Kendall Square, which is where MIT is located. And they're looking at the effect that that will have on the commuter and the rest of the, of the, of the, of the city. And um, there, the way they tackled it was to simulate, uh, to, to, add a, to, to add, make a core simulation of the city and complement that with a smaller scale simulation of the area around the district that was going to be developed. But I don't think I have a good answer for that actually. Okay, anyone from Passimo or, or even from, um, uh, I, would, I would say Google Earth, but you're not from Google Earth. <laughs> but uh, because the question of scale here is, is so important. So Passimo first maybe. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to put actually in speaking for the Passimo part of our two projects is um, we, we try to, to take it rather as an advantage, um, this challenge, because it, for us, it, it's part of the research focus of like for setting up the research focus. Um, where, where do we, where, what is the problem actually? Do we in, in the district development of a marginalized social district, a uh, social housing district that we've presented was about um, people complaining that the public space is full of garbage and so on. And so you can try to frame that as is this, could that result um, out of uh, a huge fluctuation of the, of the population? Um, do we want to frame it uh, like that or in another way? So we try to keep it this way. But of course you have also always border conditions that should also, yeah, be part of the discussion. So you have same if you talk about, um, for example, statistical districts also, you have the same issues. So, um, but I'll let the uh, word to Diego maybe also for the mobility part of it. Yeah, so Gabriela, you can go ahead if you want. That was your part of bringing stakeholders to the model. Yes, what I can add to what the colleagues mentioned in our case, we are working with an issue that it's very neighborhood level delimited. It's a last mile issue. And uh, what we uh, what we had as, uh, as a relevant element to think about this systemic connection among this neighborhood level and the city was actually brought by our stakeholders. While we were together defining the, the issue and, and looking into what are the parameters that should be taken into account to build the possible scenarios, they were uh, also thinking about what aspects should be taken into account out, uh, also at the data level to uh, bring into the problematization of the issue that we were trying to tackle with our tool. Okay, so you, so you mean that the, the bounding conditions were designed or co-designed with the stakeholders themselves? 
Yes, we uh, did a workshop uh, where we together tried to define the different conditions. We used a steep method and we had this issue of the last mile and together we tried to define what are the parameters, what are the different aspects that are related to this issue and what, uh, what are the consequences in the definition of the scenarios. So we I, did it together, yes. I, I love that approach, Gabriel. I, I think this is it's actually very important because also we also tend, like you're a programmer like me, you tend to think about border conditions as spatial borders. But I think that what you're talking about is a little bit more nuanced than that is borders in the sense like, where do I finish asking the question? Like what is within the scope of my, not just the spatial scope, but also the conceptual scope. I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna also share, share a story. Like I think we have time, but it's um, remember the, the the workshop with the kids that I talked about a little a few minutes ago. So there was one story that actually shook me to the core on that workshop. That it was we asked them to draw their city, like draw like how they perceive the city, and it gets to the idea of like board boundaries, right? And there was this one kid that he drew. So like a lot of kids draw their house, you know, their friend's house, the park, their neighborhood. This kid draw his house, a line, his school, and then a line. That was it. And then we started asking him like, what do you think about your city? Like, what would you improve if you could improve something? And he said safety because my neighborhood is very unsafe. And I was like, right. So in his view, because his neighborhood is unsafe, he city, his house, the metro line and his school. And that's it. That's all he sees from the city. So it's interesting to think about like, it's not just spatial borders, like this other like perceived border and it, it, that, that's where I think Gabriela is really trying in bringing different stakeholders because sometimes you, the goal might be actually to broaden those borders and make them a little bit bigger so that we actually like can explore a bit better, more of the city. It's super interesting. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, it, re it reminds me of things I, I read uh, because I, I, didn't, I, I, I never practiced them, but about uh, participatory geography. Uh, it's a very, very interesting way of uh, of gaining gaining a little bit of uh, knowledge about how people see their own space and, uh, and and it's true that in that respect i guess that modeling uh, maybe not only agent-based modeling but at least uh, uh, modeling it's a powerful way of um, being able maybe to combine bridge the different representations of people or at least make them uh, understand the represent representations of others. So um, anyway, um, we are two it's minutes late. I, di I didn't see it. So we, we need to make a break. Well, actually, I need to make a break. Uh, it's already very late in, in Vietnam. So I would like to thank a lot, uh, all of you uh, from three continents, if I'm not completely wrong, uh, the three presenters from three continents. So thank you very much. It was really interesting. Uh, very thank, thank you all for the questions. They were great questions. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm, lot you. I'm not responsible, now, so you have to thank people in the in the chat. And um, so we make a small break of uh, seven minutes, I think, and then uh, it's a session that everyone is waiting for: COVID nineteen. So because we didn't talk about COVID nineteen enough, so. Have a very nice uh, day, morning, evening, afternoon. I don't know where. <laughs> it depends on where you are. And see you in seven minutes. And be careful with the storm, Alexis. Yeah, I will. I will try. <laughs> Bye.
Hello. Shall we start, Patrick? Mm, yes, yeah, I think yeah, we, we, we can start. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Hello and welcome to this session. I think it's a very relevant session on COVID-19, fresh in our mind. I just had my vaccination yesterday, so it's very fresh for me. Uh, anyway, the next two hours are dedicated to COVID-19, modeling of COVID-19 in various domains. And for the next half hour, we have around, well, not around, exactly three presentations. The first one is from Benoit, uh, talking about combining the classic SIR, the SIR model with ABM. And he's going to discuss about the difference between macro and micro approaches, I guess. Uh, Benoit, are you ready? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm ready. Okay, so your let's time. Go. Let's go. Uh, you can see my screen. Everything yes. okay? Okay, so so I have the, the honor to start uh, this new session. So I will discuss about my work during my uh, my internship for the my uh, last year of uh, engineering school. So the the title of uh, of the the internship was a multi scale simulation of the the COVID nineteen uh, epidemic. And I've been working with uh, Carol Adam and DJ George, and I was at the, the league uh, at Grenoble. So I will start uh, with a quick uh, introduction and I will uh, try to explain the objectives. So uh, I've been uh, working on uh, two different methodology. That was the compartmental model and the agents-based model. And uh, which of these uh, methodology are applied to different scale to two different uh, scales, macroscopic and microscopic. And uh, the, the objective uh, was to see if it's possible to, to predict the number of uh, cases after the implementation of a new policy uh, at a large scale, uh, and uh, to see if we can determine the, the new parameters of a compartmental model from a, a multi-agent simulation. So uh, I will start with the uh, a little uh, introduction to the compartmental model in uh, epidemiology. So this is the, the basic one, the, the most basic, and uh, it's based on the, the research made by uh, Kermak and uh, McKendrick in uh, 1927. So um, this uh, this model is, is uh, here to explain uh, easily uh, how, how work uh, compartmental uh, models. So uh, we will consider that uh, each person in the, the population uh, can be in uh, one of these compartments. Uh, there is the, the susceptible, infected and recovered. So uh, we will uh, suppose that uh, the person will uh, change of compartment at, uh, at each step time, depending on uh, some rate. So the, the beta is the rate of infection and the gamma is the, the mean recovery rate. And uh, so in this model, we can see that uh, the number of, of people who, who will uh, go from the susceptible uh, compartment to the infected one uh, depend on the, the force of infection. Uh, that's the, the beta and the, the E, uh, which is uh, quite logical because um, if there is a lot of people infected in the population, the, 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 the number of people who will go from the susceptible compartment to, to the infected one uh, will uh, will be became uh, uh, will will grow. So we can see in this in this uh, uh, if we we look the, the curve, uh, we can see that the, uh, at the instant t equals zero, there is a lot of susceptible in the population, but uh, more there is uh, infected in the population and more uh, and less uh, and uh, the susceptible uh, will uh, decrease uh, faster. So that is for the, the uh, first uh, introduction. So uh, I will uh, make a little uh, comparison of the two, the two methods. So uh, the compartmental uh, models, 
uh, can be applied uh, at, a, at several scale. And uh, that's one of the, the most uh, biggest advantage uh, of this kind of model. We can uh, study a department, a region, or a country. Uh, and uh, this kind of model is not really expensive in computing time. But the, the main disadvantage of the compartmental model is the fact that they are done at a posteriori. And uh, we can use that kind of model to predict anything. Uh, it just give a, and it just give a, an aggregated view, and uh, that's why we will uh, interest. Uh, uh, we and that's why uh, I'm interested uh, in an agent-based model that can uh, that can uh, use as a powerful uh, tool to decision support, and uh, the the fact that we can uh, uh, change the the applied policy and. Uh, the, and see how uh, the, the population will uh, adapt themselves can uh, help us to to see how the the pandemic will uh, will change and, and uh, propagate so uh, the first things i, I will uh, just uh, describe the the, methodolo the methodology so uh, the, the idea here was first to study uh, a compartmental model uh, and from this compartmental model, uh, we, we get the, the real number of infected over the time in uh, ESER. Uh, thanks to that uh, data, we will be able to, to calibrate the, the multi-agent simulation to, to follow the, the, the observed uh, infected. Uh, after that, we will study the, the implementation, implementation of a new policy uh, on the, the agent-based model. And we will try to extrapolate and return to a macroscopic scale. Uh, that's the DID. Uh, why we, we have to do that, and, and it's a kind of, it's quite important. It's because it's not possible with a, a compartmental model to, to predict anything, except if the, the beta stay a constant, which is completely false because the, the, the beta will change uh, depending of the, of the policy uh, applied or uh, even if we don't change the, the policy, uh, the, the people uh, we will be worried over the time of the, the quarantine, for example, of the lockdown, for example, and will disobey. And uh, that kind of uh, behavior will change the, the beta, the beta value. So, uh, the, the basic uh, compartmental model is not enough. And uh, this model is uh, more interesting and it was proposed by uh, Charpentier, that's uh, uh, Arthur Charpentier. Uh, this model is quite important because um, it's uh, in uh, the, 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 the actual pandemic, in the, in the COVID, uh, for the COVID, we don't have the, the real number of infected uh, in the population because there is some uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic. So we are not able to, to see, uh, we are not able to, to determine the, the, the real value of the beta because there is some uh, value that we don't have. And that's why we will uh, study that compartmental model because there is uh, the, uh, because in this compartment, in this compartmental model, we will uh, study also the hospitalized uh, the intensive care, uh, care and uh, the dead. And uh, these uh, three compartments uh, represent some uh, uh, value that we have and uh, that, uh, that value are quite sure. They, they are uh, something that uh, we, can, we, we can be sure about. This model is also interesting because uh, it, uh, it's, in this model, we, we make the, the distinction between the uh, symptomatic and the uh, asymptomatic. Uh, that, uh, or, uh, that are, that, that's the, the I minus and I plus. Uh, and the uh, I plus will haven't any impact on the, the force of infection. Uh, and that's uh, something uh, really interesting. So uh, to the, the first uh, work done here, was to, to estimate the, the beta uh, by using uh, a nonlinear last square regression. Uh, uh, 
so I, I have used the, the Gauss Newton algorithm uh, that I have implemented uh, in Python. So uh, thanks to that uh, algorithm, uh, we we was uh, I was able to to determine the to determine the the the, the real value of beta and uh, to to see the, the real number of susceptible over the time. So here, for example, we can see in a uh, pink and uh, purple the the observed uh, death and uh, hospitalization. Uh, at the, at the end of the, the model output gives something uh, similar and uh, we, we have the, the real value of beta and we can determine uh, the, the susceptible uh, in the, 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 the department of ESR. And uh, that's why it's really interesting to use uh, that model. So we can see, for example, here, I don't know if, uh, if it's big enough, but uh, we, we see that uh, 30% of the population in Nizer uh, have already been in uh, contact of the, the, of the COVID. So uh, we, we can see the, the propagation uh, and the number of uh, susceptible in the population. Uh, now I will uh, make a, a little description of my uh, multi-agent model because uh, that's the, the second part. Uh, I've, working, I've been working on a, on a multi-agent model. So uh, in my model, I, I have uh, uh, studied the, the city of uh, Lambin, which is um, a city in Isère. It's a little city of uh, 2,000 uh, habitants. inhabitants. Uh, in, in my model, I have uh, considered, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, take a three age uh, range the child, the active, and the, the retired. And uh, the idea was to, to see the, the, to study the, the second uh, lockdown in France to, to calibrate the model. And uh, after that, to, to, uh, to change the policy and see how the, the, the COVID will spread over the population. So uh, each people have a group of friends and uh, these people have an agenda uh, with uh, some activity to do, uh, depending of on, uh, the, on their uh, age, ra uh, age range. Um, for example, we have uh, shopping, working, resting, and, uh, and uh, go to the bar. Um, here, go to the bar uh, can be uh, considered consider as a uh, uh, go to a non-essential uh, shop, uh, which are uh, which are closed during the, the 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 second lockdown. Each of these activity will uh, will be uh, associated to a building, and uh, we will uh, just study uh, the the behavior of these people to to see how we will spread the 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 malady the the, the COVID. Each uh, Lambinois has uh, uh, can be, uh, Belinois, uh, Lambinois can be uh, symptomatic or asymptomatic. And uh, this distinction is quite important, I think, uh, because um, someone who's uh, symptomatic and uh, who's respect the, and, uh, who, who will respect the rule will uh, quarantine himself, for example. To, to avoid the, the propagation and someone who is asymptomatic can, uh, for example, uh, uh, continue to, to work and uh, will, uh, will probably uh, give the, the malady. So I will just uh, make a, a little uh, simulation just uh, to, to show uh, how it works. For example, in this simulation, uh, we will start uh, at the, the 30 October. And uh, in the, the simulation, we can see uh, in blue the industrial uh, building, pink or the, the residential, uh, yellow or non essential shopping, pa shop, uh, green or uh, shop, uh, and finally red or uh, the, the school. And we will just study the, the spread. 
and we will see over the time. Uh, at the the at the end of the 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 lockdown, we will change the rule and we will see how uh, the 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 COVID will uh, spread uh, over the population. So. <clears throat> Here, uh, the, the first thing was to, to calibrate the model because of the, the randomness uh, of, the, of uh, each uh, simulation we, we have uh, to, to study the convergence of the, the average of this experience. So uh, first of all, uh, you can see, for example, uh, the, the, the average, the, the, after uh, 30, 40 simulation, we can consider the number of uh, the, the the, the mean uh, is stable and uh, the, the idea was to to uh, fit to, to calibrate our model uh, on the infected number uh, uh, study uh, that we, we can for the number the, the the number of infected that we have during uh, thanks to the compartmental model and uh, that's the uh, that's the net point. So here, for example, we have the, the number of infected in uh, Lambin during the, the second lockdown. And uh, in, at this date, uh, we, this is the, the end of the lockdown. And uh, we see that the number of people uh, uh, will, if, uh, will become stable. And uh, this is because here, this is the, the end of the lockdown. We can uh, expect that uh, if uh, we have continued the lockdown, the number of uh, people will uh, Decrease, we follow the decrease. So uh, here are the, the first result that I, uh, that I have. So uh, the the green uh, curve represent uh, the, the the part that I have that was uh, 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 that was uh, calibrated. So uh, after the calibration, we we have that that kind of curve. Uh, something the, the curve uh, green the grief curve and uh, when we, we change the world we, we will have uh, something that uh, follow the the number of uh, of uh, infected observed uh, thanks to the compartmental model so that's something that can be uh, that's a uh, that's something good uh, after that there is some uh, something to, to discuss but uh, here is a uh, is the good things I think. <laughs> so this is the idea. So uh, yeah, in, by changing the rule, we have something that uh, that will uh, fit the, the curve, and uh, that's uh, that's cool. The there is many things to discuss, uh, however, because. Uh, for example, here, this is one simulation, and during this simulation, we will change the rule. Uh, there is, we have to, to know that uh, if uh, that there is a age range that, uh, that, that we consider, it's uh, at the end of the, the second lockdown, we, we see that uh, the number of, uh, of uh, people in each age range that uh, have already been in uh, contact of the, with them, uh, the COVID-19 is not the, the same for each age uh, range. And that's uh, quite important but because uh, if uh, at uh, the instant T, we don't consider the, the number of, uh, of people in uh, each age range that uh, we covered, we haven't the same results. And that's the, the first things to discuss. So um, here it's... Uh, some uh, perspective to, to ameliorate the, the, the model. The, one of the idea would be to use a, a new, uh, a new uh, compartmental model. For example, this one will consider uh, age range. Uh, each uh, E is a rate range and uh, the beta is the, the rate uh, of infection between uh, the, the two age range, for example, um, between uh, the, the range, the, between the he and the, the k, And uh, that's one of the, the possible uh, amelioration. There is something interesting uh, to, to discuss is the unpredictable human behavior. Uh, 
we we can sorry, see you have uh, one minute okay sorry um we we can see during the uh, after the the, th the third lockdown in france for example the after uh, some uh, for many days of privacy the uh, privation the the consumption of the the human will uh, uh, increase a lot just uh, after the, the reopening of the, the bars, for example, in uh, Grenoble, it was just impossible to, to have a table. And uh, we, we can uh, imagine that uh, the, the human will, uh, will more, consu uh, the, the consumption of the, the human will uh, increase. So it's hard to, to predict the two. And uh, that's one of the, the things to discuss. And there is uh, finally the sensitivity and the city size in the in the Lambin, the, the, there is no uh, cinema or university and uh, the, the the population density is uh, it's uh, is uh, low so we can uh, we could uh, study uh, different cities to see if uh, we can apply the, this to to uh, to any city and i will finish uh, on that so thank you, uh, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Benoit. Uh, by the way, you can also ask questions if you had any to the developers or other people. So speakers can also ask questions. Uh, let's move on. I think the questions are coming in. Uh, the next speaker, I think, will need some introduction. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Alexi. And... I understand he will introduce us to the now famous Comokit framework. Alexi, uh, your time. Thanks. Okay, can you hear me? Can you yes. see my screen? Yes. Okay, so um, basically, I'm going to present the same thing as just before, but different. Um, actually, it's um, so Como Kits, it's a um, computer model of uh, the propagation and transmission of COVID-19, but which has been designed and conceived from the beginning uh, by a quite large team. So you have all the names of the people uh, here. So it's a, a French Vietnamese team, plus the recent addition of uh, Sri Rama. I, I didn't put his name here, but it's becoming, it's becoming one of the, of the main contributors, I would say. And um, um, we will see uh, actually that it's, um, it's both a model uh, which has been used and which is still used in, in Vietnam, uh, majoritarily, but also a, a framework for building other models. And there will be some other presentations after, so I, I will not, of course, present everything. But let's go back one year, um, one year back or one year and a half back. At the beginning, beginning of the pandemics, um, Vietnam had a, a very different uh, policy uh, compared to what we found in uh, Europe, in uh, other countries, uh, a little bit similar to other uh, Asian countries like Taiwan uh, or um, uh, Pacific countries like New Zealand. Okay? But Taiwan and New Zealand are islands. Um, Vietnam is a continental country, but still they had actually a very different policy. And um, we designed Comokit at the beginning to support this policy. And uh, because this is a policy which requires um, testing a lot of things and not testing people for COVID-19, but testing a number of hypotheses. So uh, rapidly the case study, the initial case study, Vietnam is a country of, um, uh, le let's say between 95 and 100 million inhabitants. I think it's closer to 100 million. Um, in one year and a half, we had 11,000 detected cases, 74 deaths. Okay, so uh, absolutely ridiculous numbers compared to what we had in Europe. And there is no real reason to doubt about the numbers. Okay. And one of the one of the reasons why we we don't doubt about the numbers is that two of the developers of uh, Comokit are um, uh, actually part of the rapid response team of the Vietnamese government, uh, and uh, and they were really at the heart of 
the policy making uh, during um, uh, the first month and, and since then. So what, how, how can we describe uh, the policy at the national level and also at the, at the, at the local level in, in Vietnam? It has been described as a low cost or uh, I would say realistic strategy. Okay, realistic strategy because uh, the country and, and the authorities actually know the limits of the country. They know they can't stand having a number of people in reanimation. The, the hospitals would not stand uh, having a flow of people coming in with needs in terms of um, oxygen, etc., etc. So they decided very quickly to close the country. Uh, and so it means closing the borders. So they were closed very, very soon and a systematic quarantine of um, people coming in. Um, so uh, because of course you have people coming in, people coming back uh, to Vietnam or people coming in Vietnam because they, they, they have to work there or study there, etc. cetera. Um, so you, you have a systematic quarantine which is organized by the government. So it's not a quarantine like in France where Basically, you do you do whatever you want. It's a quarantine here, where uh, actually you are in host hotels, which are chosen by the government, or you end up in military camps, which are a little bit less fun uh, for uh, doing the quarantine. The schools were closed immediately uh, as soon as the first de detection of cases were were made. Uh, mandatory masks in public places, gels uh, at the entrance of, from, from the beginning, the first days, uh, very focused tests on entries, uh, but also uh, around the clusters. Um, so you, you, you have a, a very local systematic tracking and tracing strategy, which goes up to uh, naming the person in the newspapers, okay? So that uh, if you have been in contact with these people, you, you know you, you, you can, um, you, you know where you are actually in the transmission uh, lines. And uh, something we, we call here the localized containment strategy, which is that um, as soon as you have a cluster somewhere, you close the district. So when we talk about the district here, it's a, uh, what we call in, in Vietnam the commune level, which is approximately 10,000 inhabitants. So Komokit was designed at the very beginning to do that, to support Vietnamese public authorities by developing an operational simulation model, which would be able to tell, okay, is it worth um, uh, containing uh, or confining people in this place? Uh, how will it affect other, how will it disrupt other um, uh, transmissions, for example, or other uh, activities. Okay. So that was the first goal. Second goal, uh, we decided to do it in such a way that we wouldn't have to do it and to, to reinvent the wheel for every case study. Okay. So it means developing a quite modular approach and provided, uh, providing sorry, tested and very robust abstractions. Uh, already programmed, uh, from which you can simply inherit if you want. Uh, so uh, as every component in the model has been built and designed to be either uh, reused, uh, for example, for different data sets, if you want to change the case study, extended through specialization and inheritance, or uh, replaced easily without having to change everything. So for example, the epidemiological model, you, you can just unplug the existing one and plug the new one. So it's not always that easy, but basically the spirit is it's, uh, this one. Um, second thing, uh, we have progressively in the last 18 months built uh, different versions of Tomokit with different time and space scales. You know? And they are being progressively added as extensions of the original model with uh, adaptations, of course, of the main algorithm. The, uh, the transmission or even policy algorithm cannot be the same at different time and space scales. And some of them will be presented in the next sessions. So, uh, sorry. So um, the first goal, supporting public authorities, we decided really to stick with the policy of the Vietnamese government. So to say, okay, our scale will be the district of a commune around 10,000 inhabitants, around this size of, uh, of space. Um, and we will, uh, as much as we can, work on this scale 
and provide um, uh, a time scale uh, uh, of one hour, okay? so a time step of one hour, uh, we, we, which was uh, considered as uh, quite coherent with the space spatial scale we were using. Uh, of course, we used, well, I say, of course, at this scale, uh, the individual properties, so uh, whether or not people um, are able for, um, will follow the rules or not, uh, the interaction, the fine interactions between people in uh, transportation, in uh, companies, in the school, etc., etc., they play a very important role. If you if you are at the level of um, uh, a country, for example, uh, maybe you can abstract a number of these things and, and build average, and, and you don't have to care too much. When when you deal with ten thousand people moving around in a small city. You have to represent them individually if you want to understand what can happen, okay? And if you want to understand also how people can adapt to the different rules and strategies. So the overview of Komokit, so you have all the details in the, in the papers, in a paper we all published, uh, we are the, in the Frontiers in Public Health in um, uh, August 2020, I think. Um, so the whole, uh, Tomokit is organized around, uh, I would say, um, five main entities. So the, the first entity, the individuals, people, okay, so we take people individually, the buildings where they live, where they work, where they study, the authority, and then two abstract um, uh, entities of the model, so we, which are we, which do not have, uh, I, I would say, a, a concrete correspondence in the world in terms of uh, objects or people. So policies on one hand and activities of people on the other. Okay. So uh, Comokit uh, is built around these uh, six, uh, sorry, five uh, components and. They more or less represent each uh, some sub models. So it's not completely the case because, of course, you have models that will link some of these entities. Uh, so, of course, you have the spatial and built environment and demographic of the case study, which is a, a sub model by, by itself because we need to pre process some of the data. The epidemic state evolution, uh, disease transmission between people, mobility using agendas and the activity of people, and the design of policies and the application of these policies. Okay. So the um, I, will, I will go very fast on this one because it's uh, well very, qu quite classical now. Uh, so the epidemiological status of each individual is represented by this kind of uh, uh, state machine. Okay. So a model between with uh, um, uh, the possibility for one individual depending on its interactions to move from one state to another, okay? So susceptible, latent, removed uh, with a number of different infectious states, which are quite important here. And the fact that you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, and then where you're taken in charge by a hospital or a health service, then uh, you, you, can, um, you can be in different states also in this, um, in, in this service. And this, this means a lot regarding the policy compartment, okay? Of these steps. Then the policy sub model. The policy sub model, we paid a special attention to build something very modular and flexible. So you can add policies and you can declare them in a quite declarative way, actually. You can declare policies and combine them. Okay. So you have compound policies, policies composed of a list of other policies that will be uh, done in parallel or sequentially, etc. Forwarding policies. So for policies that would modify other policies, for example, by imposing some time limits on, a, on a other policies. And of course, the concrete policies, which can be uh, detecting, uh, hospitalizing people, um, uh, testing people, uh, I already, already said it, but uh, forcing people to remain at home, uh, confining people, et cetera, et cetera. So whenever you combine these different, I, I just, show two, two models, but whenever you, com you combine these different models, you can run experiments. So this is an example of experiments here, where uh, basically you compare a number of um, uh, scenarios and you compare also the application of policies. Okay. 
of course, you can complexify them. Here, it's a very simple example. You can complexify by taking cultural traits, so things we saw yesterday or the day before. Uh, so, for example, will people comply to rules or not? Uh, what is the influence of the percentages of people who do not comply to rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So here you have uh, one example of how we used Como Kit. Uh, here you have another one. This time with five different, uh, uh, five different. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, simulations. Okay, which are run in parallel, and we co which compare actually the same policy, but this time. Uh, with different durations, for example. Okay, so you, you change a little bit the parameters, uh, no mask, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with the same uh, uh, detection policy or anything. So Comokit, that's what the initial uh, model, and uh, actually it is available. It is open source, like Gamma. It's free. It's available at uh, Comokit.org on the on the website where you have a tutorial, you have documentation, you can uh, you can play with the model actually. Uh, once you install Gamma, of course. It can be forked, it can be modified, or you can also apply it directly to new case studies. Okay, so it's a kind of abstract model which can be applied in almost immediately if you have case studies that resemble the ones we, we have been uh, using. Okay, it's open to new contributions and extensions, of course. Okay. So additions of more detailed activities, coupling with existing models, uh, extension to other infectious diseases, and we are working in parallel on these different um, uh, different uh, extensions. One thing uh, which we are quite proud of is that it's now used on a continuous basis, um, of course, with other models. We are also in an ecosystem of models and tools, but by the rep rapid response teams of the Vietnamese Ministry of Health, where you can see it, Como uh, Kit here presented on TV uh, in a very serious manner. Uh, it's seen on TV, so it's, uh, it's, it's become a serious model in, in, uh, in half an hour. Uh, you can see on the, on the left, actually, uh, um, former prime minister, or vice prime minister, uh, and they were using this kind of tool, uh, Kit here, directly during the, the discussions and during the negotiations over what policy to, to, to um, uh, apply. So, a new version is already planned. Actually, most of the people who work on Comokit don't know, don't know that, but I, I think it's already planned. Uh, with us, at least two additions, which uh, we, we did not work on, uh, at least on the core model, which is one, the variants, okay? Uh, possibility to define the diffusion of different variants of a virus and, and maybe their interaction and competition, and also uh, vaccination, okay? The vaccines, so adding both a new set of policies about vaccination, but also new states parameter in the epidemiological and transmission models. We didn't do it, uh, these two ones, because uh, until uh, last month, Vietnam was uh, a little bit in a bubble and uh, was not really affected by uh, these two, well, no, nobody, or well, nobody, uh, only two million people are vaccinated and the variants were not so, so important one month ago. It has changed. And so we will also uh, uh, make the core of Comotit evolve uh, to be able to take this into account in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if I took too much time or not enough, but um, I'm done. Well, thank you, Alexi. You took a minute less, which is good. We can have more questions to the end. Uh, let me call on the next speaker, Arthur. Uh, Arthur is going to present us how we can use uh, these intense Comokit models with uh, high performance computing. So, Arthur, 10 minutes. Hello. Can you hear me? In some... I think your volume is a bit low. Oh, well, uh, hello? I don't know. Speak louder. Can you hear me well? Uh, no. Maybe you have to be closer to your mic. Yeah, or maybe choose a different input, no? Uh, yeah. Take the Is input from like the this? computer. Is that better like this? No. You, you really have to shout. <laughs> I can do it. 
I can scream if really it's needed. Yes, now it's better. Now it's better? Okay, perfect. Yes. So I'm going to share my screen again. And here we go. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present you a Python library called Comokit for Pi, which uh, has been developed to ease the use of Gamma and to explore and run Gamma headless simulations over a high performance computing workflow. Um, so first of all, uh, why using a high performance computer? Uh, so to summarize quickly what Alexi just presents you, uh, the Comokit model is at a special scale of a commune, which is around 10,000 inhabitants and 3,000 buildings it have a temporal scale of one hour. And so there is several some models working on it. So it's a pretty heavy uh, model. And so uh, in the first uh, exploration plan, plan that we carried uh, to evaluate the, stochastic the stochasticity of the model, we did uh, define that we would run 1,000 replications over uh, 111 parameters combination, which give us uh, 111,000 simulations. And one simulation lasts around one hour. So if we made this exploration on uh, a computer, which process one simulation at a time, we, it will have took us uh, more than 12 years to process all the simulations. So we quite simply understand that one computer is not enough. And that's why we use uh, high performance computing that I can just call HPC, it's simpler. And so I, I gave numbers that one laptop can make 3 billion calculations per second. And an HPC is a special computer, it's a kind of server, which is designed to process faster and better. And it can do uh, quadrillions of, cal of calculations per second. So it's Way, be way better, way faster. Uh, in the Comokit project, we had a partnership with EDF, which is the French Electricity. And we use one of their uh, HPC. And so I gave the, the hardware specs for people interested in that. But what's, what is important is that we carried with that HPC to, read, to go from more than 12 years of processing uh, below 32 hours of processing to make the full explorations, which is a pretty good uh, optimization, which is way better. So uh, how did we manage to use HPC with Gamma? So first of all, we had a pretty complicated architecture, which is, uh, which is here. Uh, can you see my, my mouse or not? Yes, yes okay, we can okay. see. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. So uh, first of all, we need to generate XML files. So I don't know if you all, uh, if you did use the gamma headless or not. But so what's important to know is that for launching uh, gamma headless, we need to generate a specific file, which is an XML file, uh, in which we have all the simulations that the gamma headless is going to run. So we had a Python script to generate these XML files. After we had to send all these files uh, into Slurm, which is a uh, software specific to HPC to run jobs, to run softwares on the HPC. So we had to uh, submit all the, the files on Slurm, which was a uh, by hand command and gathering uh, files. After it was dispatched on the, the Gaia uh, HPC. So the idea software burner uh, processing 36 simulations in parallel at the time. And after we did gather all the output results and uh, we had a R script to process the output files. So it was good because it was easy to scale uh, our explorations and it did respect the HPC constraint and workflow, but it had a lot of weaknesses. 
which were that we had a lot of different scripts and languages, which was difficult to develop, to extend, and a lot of bugs came from there. Uh, it was hard to use. There were around five commands to launch by hand per exploration. So once again, a lot of bugs can come from there. Uh, Gamma Headless isn't that much good to uh, split and parallelize on that many cores. So we wanted to change and launch more Gamma Headlesses, which could uh, have created more bugs if we did keep that workflow. And uh, all the scripts and all the, that work was to this particular workflow with EDF. So a lot of weaknesses and not that many strengths. And that's why we did develop the Como Kit for Pi library, which pretty much gonna handle all that first part into one script. So what it does, it, it creates all the needed files for the exploration from the gamma headless uh, side, it uh, it can launch uh, the gamma exploration on Slurm on any kind of servers by itself very simply. And after we did change all the R uh, post processing scripts into uh, that library. So actually, the idea is to simplify the workflow for uh, people developing, so for us in the, in the KomoKit project. And with that library, what we did is that we, we kept all the, the strengths that we had on the previous uh, workflow, but we also fix all the previous weaknesses. So it's easier, just one script, one languages, better usage of gamma headless, which was the, the, uh, an optimization and gamma usage problem less components, so less potential bugs. Uh, everything is coded in the Python script and it's very lightweight, just one small library instead of having to share a lot of files. And so the idea and the, the result is that in less than 40 uh, line of Python, we are able to generate, launch, gather results and generate uh, outputs, uh, data visualizations outputs uh, over our, our exploration, which is pretty good. So just to go a bit in detail and show you that it's 40 lines of code and they are not even complicated. The first point is that we just define what is our gamma. So just to have the script and the commands knowing where to ask and where to launch the command. After we have uh, what is called the gamma exploration, which is what experiment name, what gamma file, how many replications, what is the final output step, and calculate all the experiment space. So if you are a bit familiar with the headless command line, you, it seems pretty, pretty close that, to what you used to, to type. And finally, we just define a workspace with the gamma object that we just defined previously, the exploration object that we just defined previously, an output uh, folder, and uh, we're ready to go. We generate the needed files for exploration and we launch the gamma headless. So there we can choose to launch it on the server or on Slurm or whatever. And the script gonna launch gamma, all the gamma needed, all the gamma asked and wait till the end. So after, once that function is done, so once the, the exploration is finished, so I have a, a small print. And here is a few more lines to generate the output that I did show you previously. So 40 lines of code, really simple, very, very fast. And so the advantages are that it's really easy to use, to have a strong HPC compatibility, compatibility so especially the Slurm one. And it have all the Python powerful data visualization library and tools that we can imagine. The only problem that we have right now is that it's really hard to the ComoKit uh, model. And we still have to continue to develop it, especially to be able to gather all the gamma models and to have a more generic library. And that's what we're gonna, what we plan to, uh, 
what we plan to, to work on for the development of that library. Um, thanks everyone for your attention. I think I did respect the, the time. And so... Yes. Yes, thank you, Arthur. Thanks. Uh, now we have some time come for questions. I see there are a few on the chat. Um, if I start with Benoit, Benoit, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm sure you read the questions, uh, but for the audience, let me take the first one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is your simulation step? Well, the, the simulation, simulation step is uh, 10 minutes, and uh, that's uh, all uh, us to, to see uh, the, the, the propagation in transport, for example. So we can uh, see if uh, they, they, they can uh, uh, be fast, if uh, someone can uh, get the, the COVID uh, during uh, the, the transport between uh, his home and his work or during uh, the, the way to, to the, the shop or something like that. And I think it's quite interesting to, to see. So okay, that's okay. And there are a few questions on calibration. Uh, how did you generate the population? That's the first one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and how many parameters did you use and how did you calibrate what processes, etc.? Okay, so the, yep. for, for the first uh, question, uh, the, the population is uh, generated uh, by uh, looking at the NC number. So the, the idea was to to make uh, a projection. So I just uh, take the number of Fizer and I have tried to, to simulate the population who will follow the, the real number uh, of uh, Fizer. So that's five, if, uh, if it was the questions. And uh, that's uh, how uh, I generate my population. I will, uh, I will follow the number of uh, Fizer. I don't know if uh, it's an uh, answer to the questions. Uh Three, are you happy? I will have uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, then I have some questions for Arthur. Yes. Would it be complicated to allow someone run uh, Gamma from Python? Actually, it depends what you mean by running gamma. If you just want to generate the XML file and uh, launch the uh, Java gamma application, it's not that much complicated. After, if you want to go a bit more in detail, if you, it will depend what tricky part you want to do with your, your Python script. Okay, I have a very similar question as Arno. Mm -hmm. How different or how similar is it to OpenMall? Uh, well, it's completely different. Uh, mm -hmm. At first, we did want it to use OpenMall to make the, the exploration of uh, ComoKit, especially because OpenMall is really great uh, as it uh, includes a lot of exploration algorithm especially the genetical algorithm and stuff like this, uh, which uh, the Python library that I did co-develop doesn't. Uh, what my library does is that it just make full uh, exhaustive exploration over one experiment, uh, which is great and bad, uh, depend what constraint we do have. But uh, we did need it, that library, uh, especially because uh, the HPC did had two uh, strong constraints that I didn't explain that much. Uh, the first one is that it was really, really complicated to send and receive uh, files from the HPC because the HPC was not connected to internet. So we did need it to have a very easy tool to generate and make all the potential complicated parts about running Gamma Headless in the easiest way uh, from the person who was launching the, the script. 
That's why also we do want it to reduce the number of command lines that you have to launch per expiration. So long story short, it's totally different. Okay. Uh, oh. uh, I have two questions. One for Alexi. Uh, Professor Alexi. Uh, <laughs> I was perfectly happy with your <laughs> question. <laughs> now I have one since long. Uh, do you think you would release a gamma that is very specific to Como Kit so that it's not coming with all the baggage of uh, other gamma gamma uh, uh, tools or extensions? Something very light, just for a Como Kit user. Um, I think one of the well, I, I don't know exactly. I my my point is that. What the, the interest I see actually in a tool like uh, Gamma when you work on the Como Kit on COVID-19, but also, for example, when you work on transportation or anything compared to very specialized platforms, is that actually you, you can test the inclusion of sub models which maybe don't have any, any relationships at first with uh, COVID-19. So it means um, even if the, 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 let's say, for example, the, the people in, in the, the Como Kit model right now don't use any uh, uh, very complicated decision making process, but then you want to study how uh, they adapt and uh, maybe comply or not comply to the different rules, then you need something a little bit more complicated. You will, having directly something like the simple BDI uh, plugin is handy. Okay, I don't, I don't say you, you need to use it or you have to use it, but at least it's handy uh, having the possibility to, to study, uh, to, to, to combine a couple, uh, something about COVID-19 with uh, uh, mobility, okay? Uh, and, may, and maybe at a, at a smaller time scale, uh, it's handy as well, uh, if your hypothesis is on this. So I'm a little bit reluctant in saying, okay, let's, do something which is only on on COVID nineteen, for example, because for me it doesn't mean anything. Uh, COVID nineteen, it's not it's not a, a subject. What is a subject is uh, transmission of the disease with respect to uh, mobility of people, with respect to the cognition of people, with respect to the memory of people, how the authorities do their things, etc. So I'm always a little bit reluctant in doing very specific tools for the very specific domains or very specific applications. But I may be wrong. I completely uh, uh, accept this. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one for Arthur. Arthur, now you are imposing another language to the modeler, let's say Python, if, if it's a social scientist then he or she has to have an understanding of Python, install Python and some libraries and catch up with the versions in the Python. Do you think there could be a translator in Gamma which could read Gamma syntax uh, of an experiment and it could translate to Python in the background just so that a simple users can still, uh, I mean, use your uh, exploration. Why was it has to be Python? Why not something in a gamble that still pushes uh, headless? I'm not sure to, to, to understand what, what you ask is that. So I understood the, the, the first part about the problem about learning Python, but what you want to... I mean, Gamma still has some exploration, basic exploration. Now we are talking that it should go to the HPC. Yeah. And Gamal itself cannot have something that pushes the model to HPC instead of having to install another language and all uh, the dependencies. Well, um, so once again, Kevin going to be happy, but it's going to depend. Uh, the, the, the first reason, the primary reason why I did develop that library is that uh, in the full run of ComoKit, at the very early, everything had to be developed and to be done very fast. That's why at the, the very beginning, we had that hacky uh, architecture. Uh, after the, the idea about that library, 
is uh, not to make models. The idea is that uh, the HPC environment, the HPC ecosystem can be something pretty complicated. Uh, you have to uh, learn Slurm, you have to learn the command line, you have to learn a lot of things if you really want to master it all. And the idea was more to uh, give a small library, which okay. was not too complicated to use and can be used by modelers to quickly uh, deploy and run uh, gamma exploration over HPC about over uh, yeah. big resources. Uh, after uh, your question is why uh, gamma headless cannot do it right now. Well, I, I think I have to stop you because of time. Okay. But so uh, let me let me short, uh, text you in Slack. Gonna, yes. Long story short, just in few words, it's something that I, I want to work on to be able to do that right away with Gamma Headless. Okay, let's take it to Slack. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Uh, I give it back to Patrick. Patrick, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. But uh, I think it's, uh, Chi is going to chair the last session. So I, I hope that you're not too tired for the last session. Are you here? Yes, yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, okay, so we start right away or there is a five minute break or? No, 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 uh, right away. <laughs> right away, right away, yeah. okay. So, so uh, thank you for being at the last uh, session of this Gamma Days. So we kept the best uh, uh, speakers for the last part. So thank you to be here and uh, I hope you will be there until the end of the session. And we'll start right away with um, Andres Kolubri. Uh, so if I'm right, Andres Kolubri is a computational scientist and media artist and he works at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. So he will talk about individual level modeling of of COVID-19 epidemic risk using gamma simulation data. Okay, so. The floor is online. We can hear you. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect, thank you so much, Patrick, for the introduction. And I'm gonna get started. Um, here we go, so yes. Um, the goal here is to create models that give the risk of uh, infection for individuals. <clears throat> And I'm doing this because we want to use data as a, such as contact tracing and self-report symptoms to, to create these models and to inform uh, individuals in the population of their risk of exposure. We can use data that comes from these new technologies like contact tracing, digital contact tracing, and symptoms that can be collected in different ways. And I've been developing some <clears throat> uh, uh, models that take, integrate all these data sources and give you a time-based time risk, and that's available on ArcSight. And uh, as you probably know, um, the use of digital contact tracing has been a uh, focus of attention. Uh, Google and Apple introduced this framework uh, for, for digital contact tracing, and uh, I'm sure that you have seen many of these apps uh, around the world. Um, so we have these data sources right now that we could incorporate. Um, in the same vein, we have apps that allow us to uh, collect symptoms from individuals that they can self-report. We actually working <clears throat> here in collaboration with file information design in the developing in the, in the development of, of such apps that we have been deploying in, in, in uh, several uh, um, sites in the US. So the, the, the question is how we can use this data to model individual risk. And there, is, there are very general frameworks, and um, here I want to, uh, to mention how we can do it. This is a, a way in which we take um, a, the, uh, let's say, the exposure of an individual. So let's say we, we want to calculate the probability of infection of an individual, I, at time t, that, that, that's a, the, the, the quantity we have there, p i of t. And we need to know the number of contact of exposures of that individual. So we can get that data from digital contact tracing. Uh, we need some way of modeling the susceptibility of that individual, uh, as well as the transmissibility of all the uh, infected individuals that that person came in contact at time t. And then we have other uh, uh, um, 
parts of this model, such as an infectious kernel that might depend on the distance, how long the, the two individuals are in contact, and some other, some other uh, um, terms that take into account uh, factors that are not dependent of the, of the interactions. Um, so yeah, we want to do this for all the individuals in the population, and we can model this in different ways using this transmissibility and uh, uh, susceptibility function. The question is how we determine these parameters, right? all the A's and the B's. And um, on the other hand, we have a population level models that we, all, we are all very familiar with, right? The compartmental models mm -hmm. that have been already discussed. And these models can be parameterized with easy to access data. And essentially, with case level data, we can, we can try to fit the, the epidemiological parameters in these models. It's not easy, but the, the data at, the, at least is <clears throat> very easily accessible. And we have seen how much data is, uh, how much uh, case data we can we can uh, um, obtain for coding. Um, so the question is how we connect these two levels. We have models that we want to use to characterize the risk of individuals, but those might be very difficult to parameterize because how do we determine those uh, those parameters that determine the uh, the individual risks? And then we have population levels that can be constructed using uh, these readily accessible data. So you could say, well, individual models determine the population uh, level dynamics, but can we go the other way? Can we use data from the population level to, to try to fit the, those, those parameters that determine uh, the individual risks? And the goal of, uh, of this, this work is to do that and use uh, common kit as a way of testing these, these statistical approach. Um, <clears throat> So how do we connect these two levels? Um, so the idea is to, uh, to find some linkage functions. So if you think of the infection, the beta parameter in, in, the, in the compartmental model, you could connect that with individual level probabilities in this way. I'm gonna leave this as an exercise. We have in 10 minutes uh, enough time to see it, but you can kind of intuitively think of beta as the contact rate by the probability of transmission that, that connects with these individual level probabilities I uh, 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 being infected by J at time, at time T. It's kind of an average in a way um, there. And uh, with that, we could, if we replace all of these uh, uh, functions in there, we get a way of connecting. So beta is, is a parameter that we have in, in our uh, compartmental model. And if we replace all of these functions there, we'll, eventually we are writing beta as a function of the A's and the B's. And the X, so I forgot to mention that, the X and the Y's are the kind of the, the, the individual level covariates. Could be age, could be you know, uh, anything that is defined at the level of the individuals, right? So uh, we have a way of connect, of linking the two levels of, of beta, of information. Now, what do we do? Well, we can apply maximum likelihood estimation. And, um, Considering what the, the now our observed data is the case counts over time. This is data that we can easily access, and then we can also consider as known data the uh, the covariates for the infection, in, infected individual individual and their contacts over time. And then we this is a Markov process. We can apply uh, various um, um, methods to do uh, MLE, and in particular, I've been using uh, this. Uh, R package called pump um, that, that takes advantage of the Markov property of, of the dynamics to, to do the maximum like, likelihood estimation in a very efficient way. So um, the dynamics is defined. So this is the basic definition of the dynamics at the, at, the, at the population level, just a compartmental model uh, discretized in time. We have an observation model, which means uh, well, the cases that we actually observe, which are not the, the true data. And then we, for the purpose of this uh, experiment, I have to also say as, as, a, as, a, as a disclaimer, this is like a toy model and use a very simplified, uh, a success, I use very simple susceptibility and transmissibility, transmissibility functions with only two, uh, with one covariate each. So you can think of the X as the immune status of the, of the accepted individual, like zero, a normal, a person with normal immune system, and maybe one, uh, like low immunity. And, y, and the Y would be, for example, the symptomatic status of the infected, the infectious individual. Uh, and these are uh, one, I mean, the kernel is just one, so it's a constant function and we don't have any other effects. It's a very simple, so for the purpose of testing this approach, I only have four parameters, A0, A1, B0, B1. And that's how uh, I, at that moment, said, well, I don't have the data, the real data to do this, uh, at least when I started working on, on, on these models. So I'm gonna just generate my own data. I'm gonna, I'm gonna generate my own uh, uh, individual uh, population population. And then the, the cool thing about this is I can set my, my ground truth. 
essentially I set my, my model at the level of the A's and B's, and then I, I try to, rec to recapture those parameters. So I essentially run uh, uh, common kit simulations using essentially, well, this is an older version of common kit from last year. And then I collected uh, all my individuals. And uh, that's kind of what I used for the maximum likelihood estimation. I set my true, my ground truth, and then I, I had uh, all of these uh, um, essentially uh, uh, data sets that then I could use to find, to try to recapture the A's and the B's. I had to do some parameterization because uh, of the, sy the symmetry form of the function. Um, there was a better way of defining this in terms of the C's, which is just the products of, of, of these in, in, in initial coefficients. And with that, I have my beta as a function of those, those individual coefficients. And, and then I did some testing with some true values. And then I was able to see, OK, can I recapture those? And this is uh, showing those tables that uh, give uh, okay, the true values and then the mean of the maximum likelihood estimation and, and the devi deviation. Um, so uh, this is a kind of a graphical way to show, okay, if the, the red dots are my estimate, my parameter estimates, if they're closer to the, uh, to the horizontal line means that the estimation is good. In some, some cases, the estimation was not, I mean, this is something that is work in progress, but in, in, in several of the, of the of experiments, I was able to recapture the original parameters, the individual level parameters by doing the maximum likelihood, likelihood estimation on the population level data, generated with, 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 uh, with uh, common kit. So, um, and then I use this uh, as a way of uh, running some scenarios. But again, these are very simple toy level models, but it was interesting as a way of saying, okay, if, I, if I'm able to, to recapture my individual parameters, can I then run uh, scenarios uh, using uh, uh, common kit? And then I compare a situation where there is a quarantine that has a delay versus another scenario where the, the, uh, the quarantine is implemented immediately, which is not that re very realistic. Uh, but in, in any case, uh, I was able to, um, to run simulations with different parameter sets and see how uh, the number of cases would, uh, would um, uh, change based on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, the, on the different uh, levels of quarantine. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so essentially, uh, as a conclusion, um, this framework seems reasonable. This is just the first exploration of how we can link le individual level and population level models uh, tested with common kit. Um, and uh, of course, very simple model, but it could be expanded. And the similar initial are, are, are promising. We could uh, recapture the parameters, the, tr the ground truth, and we can then use that, that ground truth to define a risk function that allows us to, to test different, different uh, interventions. So um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, yes, of course, <laughs> to thank you for making Gamma and Common Kit. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, don't forget to, to ask questions on the chat if you want, so we can discuss it at the end of, uh, uh, of the session. Um, so we're going to listen to the next talk from Sion Kim. I don't know if I pronounce well. So if I'm right, correct me if I'm wrong, Sion Kim is uh, no. working in built environment, urban planning, and transportation at Eindhoven University of Technology. Thank you. That's Can right. you hear me? Yes. This is my screen. Okay, so we, we will hear to your presentation uh, on Comakit Albatros, an agent based, activity based model on COVID 19 simulation. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Hehan Kim. I'm working as a postdoc in Eindhoven University of Technology. In this presentation, in about next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about Comokid Albatross, an agent-based and activity-based model on COVID-19 simulation. This is an outline of this uh, uh, presentation. As a background, maybe already almost everyone are pretty aware of it, but I'll briefly introduce the two model systems, which are Comokid and Albatross. First, Comokid is an agent-based model based on gamma, which simulates uh, infection dynamics and policy intervention against COVID-19. It is a complex integrated model that combines several uh, sub-models such as transmission activities and epidem epidemiology, et cetera. And Comokid have been designed to be executed at a city scale, which may comprise of around uh, 10,000 agents. In addition to this, uh, 
ComoKit has a built-in modules for generating synthetic population and their uh, activity agenda. However, one of the caveats here is that these modules are entirely based on many uh, predefined parameters, which may deteriorate the model's uh, interpretability and, and the model performance at the end. Moreover, with this uh, synthetic agenda, it is difficult to explain the policy intervention scenarios such as working from home because the Comocket built-in modules are not able to describe the agent's changed behavior due to policy intervention such as telecommuting. Albatross may cover the limitation what I mentioned in the previous slide. It is a kind of activity-based transport demand model that has a rich history in, in transportation field. In a simple word, Arbatros can simulate, simulate a data-driven activity pattern and travel of the agent. It mimics the decision-making process of the agent based on decision trees derived from uh, activity diary data in real world. From this word, uh, from this model, we can understand who interacts with who, where, for how long, and which transport mode they use, and so forth and so on. With a uh, high temporal and with high uh, temporal and spatial resolution. In the current uh, version of Albatross, it is targeted to simulate activity agenda at a national scale at one minute time scale. Moreover, regarding the population synthesis, a built-in module generates population based on statistics using iterative proportional fitting. And therefore it guarantees that the attributes of the generated population match real world statistic. Against this background, we plan to combine the activity-based model, which is Albatross with an epidemiology agent-based model, which is Comokit. However, there are some hurdles to leave because of different scales in time and space of the two model systems. In this context, we had to develop a new epidemiological dynamic module uh, with an adoption of infection probability function to model the dynamics in transition between susceptible and exposed. Basically, this function determines the probability to become infected or exposed so at the every end of activity, the agent's status will be updated. And the parameters in these functions are our interest of calibration. The model will be calibrated using available data, such as number of daily hospitalizations and number of daily deaths. So our final goal is to develop a large scale simulation model, which covers multi-million agents. So we are currently using Dutch supercomputer and open mode platform for calibration. If the parameters are calibrated, we can assess several policy scenarios posed to each of two uh, model systems. In a my microscopic level of human to human interactions, Common kit can be used, such as wearing mask or social distancing. Whereas the scenarios incurring significant changes in daily activity agenda can be reflected by albatross. To sum up, our aims can be summarized into three folds. First, it will replace common kit population agenda with uh, albatross population agenda. Second, a new infection dynamic modules will be implemented. Third, the combined model will be calibrated in terms of uh, the epidemiological parameters in the infection dynamics function. Next, I will explain uh, how we develop an infection probability function, which is a core component to, to integrate Comokit and Albatross. Uh, in the updated infection dynamics in Comokit Albatross, it consists of two parts an infection dynamic part and uh, and the preset epidemiological parameters part. The, the dynamics in the first part are related to people's behavior, while that of second part, that of the second part rely on the characteristics of COVID-19 itself, such as incubation period, 
or uh, infection period. So as you may know, uh, we cannot control the second part. So most policy measures try to intervene the first part to reduce the infection rate in a way that uh, to reduce the context or wearing mask, etc. And therefore, also our interest is also to simulate this uh, first part. In order to model the first part, we have adopted uh, the infec infection probability function, which determines the probability to become infected depending on the number of interacts, their duration, and the, and the intensity of the uh, interaction. As I mentioned earlier, these parameters are of our interest and to be calibrated. First, we need to draw the total number of people at the time step t while individual n is conducting some uh, an activity k. According to the social network group, different weights are assigned for the stratified sampling. For example, if there are friends around individual n, they will have a higher chance to be sampled. Second, different weights for viral shedding rates are adopted as shown in the table. For example, asymptomatic agents will have a less viral shedding rates than symptomatic people. And the contact intensity is determined by the density of people in the area and the different weights will be assigned by different uh, activity types and social network group. For example, social and leisure activity types will have a higher uh, higher weights than other activity types. And the people within social network group have a higher weight than, than others, strangers. The next uh, duration of interaction is calculated for each activity. This diagram shows how the total duration of interaction between an individual and other three individuals is calculated. While for the second part of the epidemiological part, we have used uh, default parameter values in Comokit. And there is also one part to calculate the number of hospitalization and deaths, uh, which are clinical parameters. We've also used uh, the default parameters in, in Comokit. So as a pilot study, we first tried the model in, for the city center of Eindhoven in the, ne in the Netherlands which covers around 3,000 individuals with 2,000 households. And this is a result of the baseline scenario without a control measure, which is baseline. So, uh, it is to be noted that as a graphical validation, the results seems in line with other case studies in China, but still uh, parameters need to be calibrated. As a conclusion, we have developed a base model for COVID-19 spread, which can be more realistic using the activity agenda and population created by uh, Albatross. The model would be sensitive toward the policy intervention and therefore it can provide a useful, insight, useful insights toward the assessment of the control measure. However, there are some tasks still need to be done. First, we are planning to calibrate the model at a national scale with multi-million agents with the aid of, with the aid of Dutch supercomputer. If the parameters are calibrated, then we can assess several policy scenarios posed to the each of two model systems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, again, don't hesitate to post questions on the chat for later. Uh, meanwhile, we'll hear the next uh, talk. Uh, so the next talk will be by Zhuong Ngo from uh, Vietnam and Ba Kwa in Hanoi. Uh, he will talk about commodity region and simple agent-based method for understanding large-scale COVID-19 transmission risk between regions. Uh, so hello everyone. Hello.
We listen to you. Yes. Um, well, let me. There we go. So uh, I'm uh, today. I'm gonna present uh, Komukit region. It's a very small little add-on to uh, the existing framework of uh, Komukit uh, from uh, the Komukit team at um, uh, Hanoi University of Science Technology and uh, the um, uh, rapid uh, response team uh, to uh, COVID in uh, Vietnam. So uh, just a, a little bit of a caveat. So this model alone is. Uh, it's, I actually learned a lot from uh, the previous two uh, presenters about um, uh, doing a large scale Komukit presentation and some of the uh, work, uh, previous work in literature. So uh, actually my background was uh, not uh, related to uh, epidemic uh, modeling. I was, uh, I'm a graduate student at Anu University of Science Technology on uh, doing uh, deep learning and you know, uh, neuro, uh, doing research in like neural networks. But uh, uh, in light of the uh, Komukit uh, situation, uh, in light of the COVID uh, situation in Vietnam, uh, I want to try to try find some way to contribute uh, some part of uh, my work into helping a policy maker in Vietnam better understand uh, the spread of COVID. So uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, the introduction and uh, some of the uh, related work. Uh, now, uh, back, uh, so back in, uh, I believe, uh, March, the uh, COVID situation in Vietnam was getting a little bit uh, e um, easier. The case are going down. Uh, there are almost no scenarios. So policies maker in Vietnam were very much, uh, 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 find, uh, they, uh, we believe that uh, we need to find some way to better uh, understand the situation and equip for future outbreaks. So one of the main problems issues with um, previous approaches, you know, we mentioned a lot of that in our conversation today, uh, individual agent-based model, uh, uh, equation-based model, and the grid-based method of population models. All, all of them are very good at uh, doing uh, showing uh, the, uh, the micro level interactions between uh, agents. But one thing uh, very concerned uh, policy maker is, uh, number one, the, uh, uh, these models are not guaranteed to be robust. And the second thing is they uh, often require a large amount of data and scalability. So some of uh, the um, pros of individual agent-based model, as mentioned, uh, has a very high level of realism. It's very like, flexible and it has high level of uh, explainability. However, uh, the uh, many criticisms mentioned the scalability and robustness. So one of the approach is, can uh, we find a better kind of representations of individuals that can help us improve performance and provide better findings for policies maker? So one of the uh, ways that you know, approach here is we first we identify what kind of models we want to build first. And here's a simple taxino, taxonomy of models. Now in the um, bottom, we have the, the statistical models, which are uh, being the most focused at the moment. They are, they have a, they are very easy to scale. They are, they have been, uh, they are, they are easy, very easy to tune and be uh, robust. However, you have the um, less than that. You have when you want to include some information prior into statistical model, you want to include like a graphical uh, features into the model. Uh, you are gonna sacrifice some part of your, your robustness. You're imp imp you're improving uh, prior into your models, and then thus you risk overfitting. And then you get to more and more realism models, like the mechanistic and physical models are the differential equations model. They are the comp normal compartment based model used in uh, epidemic mo modeling. And agent based model even one a higher level of uh, realism than a mechanistic and physical model. So uh, they are not, uh, 
uh, they have uh, many issues in um, to uh, providing useful uh, predictors for policy maker. So uh, when we build uh, the approach for communicative regions, our main questions is, so now here we have a configuration of provinces and we have like the travel rate between these provinces and all other provinces in between. So a probability of someone, uh, one way that we can think about the probability of infection is the probability of someone getting infected on one province travels to another province. And the probability here has to be the probability of the, the person get infected who was not detected by policies maker. Because if the person was detected, he will be quarantined and there's no way he could travel to any other provinces. So we, you have to build the hypothesis of uh, this latent class that is undetected. And you can uh, have a good estimated of the estimation of this based on the historical data of known cases in Vietnam and when, when have they been detected. And assuming that you have a good estimation of these latent cases, the uh, transportation rate between these uh, region and uh, the risk at the relative region can be uh, simply computed by the base formula. And you can, from this, you can come up with a risk factor. And intuitively, it's very simple. Uh, you have, a, uh, if you have, a, a, say, a, a region, say uh, Hanoi, for example, you know that uh, surrounding that, Hai Zhong have a lot of people who um, was in a, a very close city to Hanoi, has a lot of uh, people who are infected. And the transportation rates from Hai Zhong to Hanoi is very high. Hanoi will have a high risk rate as well. And another thing about this model is that we believe uh, the uh, rate of uh, the risk to a certain region, it's actually independent of the, uh, uh, the uh, distance, but it's dependent on the transportation rates, which can be built by some, uh, uh, which can be estimated by the uh, bus, tra the travel data between buses and uh, other transportation method. So uh, here's the basic uh, model pipeline. Uh, we uh, collect uh, the bus transportation data and flight transport data and data, and we, uh, use that to, uh, we built uh, many uh, kinds of, uh, there are various different methods to build um, models that estimate the transportation rate. The simplest way is the bus, you take the, directly the bus transportation data itself, and that itself is an estimation for the transportation rate. Of course, you can include a bunch of other features and you can use linear model, you can use neural network and et cetera uh, to build a predictor for that. But for starters, we just use uh, the raw bus transportation data as a estimation of the transportation demand. And you then you have the data of known cases and detected uh, with time and location. And if you do uh, the, uh, if you use the raw data, you would have a much shorter amount of uh, predictive power because the, the uh, longest amount of predictive power is you have a size that the people are not being detected for a certain amount of time and you have the estimation of how long these people want to stay latent until the authority detects them. So if you just use the raw data that you have at the moment and you feed that into the model, the longest kind of predictive power you have is equal to that amount of time. But if you put uh, it more use Asian-based model, equation-based model, or even linear model, and you try to use that to predict the uh, uh, Gener basically generated more synthetic data, you can have a higher, longer predictive powers. And also a long time, uh, along with that, you can uh, do, uh, you can put a implementation of vaccination scenarios and et cetera into this model to increase your predictive power and your, the flexibility of your model, which have been quite well developed in a previous version of uh, Como Kit. And uh, from that, you can estimate the magnitude of latent case in and out that province and uh, thus compute the risk of the province. So uh, we did an uh, analysis of the risk factor of regions within Vietnam uh, seven days prior to the outbreak of Da Nang. 
Uh, however, the uh, at the time of the research, there was still problem of the um, collecting the data from the uh, bus pipeline. So we just assume the transportation rate is just an inverse function of distance. Of course, this is not true, but uh, that is basically our assumption. But still, uh, we see that uh, just prior to the outbreak in the Da Nang, because there were a lot of regions around Da Nang which have a high number of uh, cases, uh, there's going to be high chances that Da Nang is going to be uh, infected. Uh, so the uh, right now the built-in model is uh, have a uh, it's very flexible to in, uh, to incorporate into other places. You have we just have basically to input a CSV file with region and population density and population and location. And we have the transportation weight between all pairwise permutation of provinces. Now for default, uh, automatically we assume that the transportation rate is just an inverse function of distance. But if you have real data, that would uh, improve uh, the model. And you can uh, put this Comokit region into incorporate it into a, a lot of different agent-based model and uh, use that to uh, see the large scale effect of uh, 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 the agent-based model simulation. And the models can be better generalized through the changing the set of parameters. And also the all the parameters at the moment for the model is deterministic. You are not generating anything. You are not calibrating any parameters that you know because you're what you're essentially creating is just a number of risk. There are big, strong risks and there are weak risks and also there are, of course there are other factors but we believe the the only um, major factors of importance is just population density and population and uh, the uh, connected regions and the transportation rate those are the main characteristics. Of course you can add a, a lot of other different features that goes along under it but uh, uh, we are not. We don't think it's. Uh, it would improve uh, the um, model at the moment. So, uh, in conclusion, in future work, of course, this is much of very very much work in process. Um, this research has only been going on for two months now. So, of course, there will be a need to be a, a dashboard development to test model with different scenarios. And we need to incorporate flexibility in the model pipeline into multiple policy scenarios. And uh, then it also comes to uh, the place where you actually need to incorporate more uh, parameters in the model and start fine tuning the model to uh, apply it to uh, policy mix, uh, makers, assuming the uh, data are supplied uh, in a more continuous way and uh, more readily available. And uh, with that, I uh, conclude my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. So we'll keep the questions for the end of the session. Uh, and now we are going to listen to the last talk of uh, those Yama days. Uh, so, uh, so the next speaker will be Patrick Taillandier, uh, who is one of the core developers of uh, Comokit and the Gamma platform in general. Uh, it will talk about commodity building, simulating the impact of NPI against COVID-19 at building scale. Okay, so, we okay, so I will try to, to do it <laughs> quite quickly because I think you are all tired. I am tired. Uh, okay, so uh, so the idea here is to, so the, the objective of this work was to study the impact of non pharmaceutical intervention in order to minimize the propagation of COVID inside buildings. So the idea for that was just to, because I have worked with Chi and with Arno on the previous model concerning the risk of infection inside buildings, which is a proximix model. So a part of the proximix model, but presented uh, things on uh, yesterday or I think. Uh, so uh, the idea was to use uh, this proximix model, so the version of concerning the COVID, uh, with uh, Comokit. So just uh, for Comokit, for Proximix in few words, so, uh, so the, the version of Proximix dedicated to COVID-19. Uh, so the idea was to evaluate during one day uh, the risk of uh, contamination for one person. And uh, 
this uh, model allowed to take into account three types of contamination. So, so the first one is a direct contamination, so by droplet, so direct contamination. Uh, the second type of contamination is by objects, so the formite uh, transmission. So uh, in, this, in the case of uh, proxemics, uh, we use a grid for to, to model that. So uh, each engine is allocated, and so the engine is allocated in a grid that is behind the shape file, and that just uh, can add a virus probe if they are infected to uh, one of the cells of the, the grid. And this cell of the, of the grid can, after, infect other agents. And the last type of uh, contamination transmission is uh, by air, so I also the classic one. So in this case, in communicate is a bit like the formite, but we are considering a rule. So an agent that is infected is going to uh, to, uh, to withdraw some various load inside the room that can after contaminate other agents. And uh, something that is interesting with this model is that it allows to take into account several types of NPI, so such as uh, ventilation in the room, uh, mass separator between people, uh, use of sanitation, uh, uh, physical distancing, and so on. Uh, so if you are interested, you have the reference if so do not hesitate. And uh, yeah, that's something I didn't say. So here you have the version of the convocate. So you can see that people coming inside the building, doing their activity. Uh, so, and so they have an agenda and after they can go back home and so on. So usually the, the, the classical simulation step for this model is possible. So uh, the idea here, so was, as I said, to couple this model uh, with Comokit. Um, because we, we wanted to be able to study uh, not only the risk of infection, but uh, at a long time, the change is, uh, to have a very uh, epidemiological models uh, to have the state of the agent that evolved during simulation, because it can have an impact of the behavior and so on. So it's something that we wanted to, to have in the model to test some specific uh, uh, intervention uh, uh, policies. Uh, so for that, so we, we use for that uh, the epidemiological model of Comokit for individuals. So we use the same individuals as in Comokit. Uh, we use something that was quite easy to, to couple the two models is that both those models are using the concept of agenda. Uh, for our proxemics, the agenda is defined for one day. So for one day, you have all the the activity of the agents, and in common case, it's for one week. So what we did here was to extend the agenda of proxmix for one week. And of course, you can after it's a, you can repeat the different weeks, so you can have a, to simulate as many as so. Um, after that, uh, what we did is to uh, yeah. So we modify a bit uh, the transmission model of. Uh, of proxemics uh, to make it more uh, consistent with the one of Comokit. So we keep the idea of the three types of contamination, but we modify a bit the model in order to make it uh, consistent with the Comokit. And so, and it's almost finished for <laughs> this part of the presentation. Uh, just to say that now we are just, uh, as a month, we are working to. Uh, for, as so, just to say that uh, here you have an example of the model for a, a school in Hanoi. Uh, so you can see that the different rooms are like, so the, the agents are coming, uh, so the children are going to their classroom and just studying. Uh, sometimes I can go to the specific room for some activities. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's different, uh, so it's a mix of classes that are sharing the activity and uh, talk about, oh, uh, go back. Uh, to have lunch outside and to come back after the break and so And you can see that the room changed color depending on the, on the quantity of first row in the room and so But uh, what we wanted to do is to apply this model for the spread of COVID-19 in the hospital in Vietnam because it's uh, at this moment a big issue in Vietnam as a mini cluster was uh, uh, discovered on site hospital in Vietnam. So you have two articles here in the, for the the hospital that was locked down uh, after a suspect case of uh, COVID-19, and here is a uh, one hospital in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, so there's a need to have uh, to, to be able to do some simulation at uh, for, for the hospital to be able to better understand the, 
the transmission of the disease and uh, the type of policy that can be applied to avoid uh, this, this type of uh, transmission. Uh, and uh, so for that, uh, what we are currently doing is to integrate the GIS data with the hospital, but it's not so easy. Uh, define activities specific to the hospital, so for the doctor to, to for the for the kids, like doctor and patients, for instance. Then to create scenario, and after we will have to parameterize and calibrate the model. It's something that we will have to do. Uh, so it's all <laughs> for, for this part. Uh, just uh, two things that I wanted to say, and it will be quite short. Um, just uh, that, uh, as you see in the model, uh, you have people moving uh, inside the open space, taking their place, and try to avoid each other. Uh, for that, we use a specific uh, plugins of Gamma, that is uh, the Palestinian plugins. So if you are using your old version of uh, the, current, the current version of Gamma, so 181, uh, there is a plugin to do that, that you can download. Uh, and in the next version of Gamma, it will be uh, integrated inside the, the core of Gamma. So you will not have to, to uh, download the, the, this plugin. And what is the plugin is doing? Uh, first, it integrates uh, a classic avoidance uh, model. So it's a model of helping, uh, so, 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 so social force model. It's a classic one uh, for, for Priscilla. And uh, so that's a law uh, to, to avoid other Palestinian or war, for instance. But also it integrates, um, because uh, if you, were, you are here and you want to go uh, and not to this room, you have to compute a pass. So for that, we integrate, uh, we integrate it inside uh, this uh, new skills, uh, some functionality to compute from uh, an open space like this, a set of polyline, so a graph like this one. So for that, we use uh, classical approaches based on the net triangulations so that allow to compute the graph on it. And after the agent, they can just follow this uh, graph and, that, and uh, to avoid other uh, agents to use uh, this uh, evidence model. And of course, uh, we take care of having something quite optimized to be able to simulate uh, hundreds or uh, thousands of agents at the same time. It was uh, used also for the escape project. Yeah, for, for the, just to show you that uh, like this agent can compute that. Mess. The last thing that I wanted to, to speak about uh, is that uh, for Comokit, uh, it's not for Comokit buildings, but for Comokit in general, um, uh, one of uh, the important issues was to facilitate the construction of case studies. Uh, we wanted that people that who want to use Comokit uh, we are able to uh, just uh, in a few minutes or a few hours to be able to uh, apply Comokit for, this, for the, their case study. And for that, uh, something that we did is to integrate inside Comicit some tools uh, that are, I think can be useful for, for many other models. For instance, uh, I develop a model, so it's in Gamel, that allow, if you have just have the extension of an area, like this one, which I'm shown uh, here, to uh, directly, so you just have to set which shape uh, you want to use, and directly Gamma is going to download all the data uh, that will be necessary for running the model after. So it's going to download directly the, the, the right uh, open state map data uh, for the building, for the world, for what you want. And uh, the download as well a uh, satellite image from being. So like this, uh, you don't have uh, by yourself to, 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 to search for data. You can just say, okay, this is a boundary of my area and directly uh, just uh, run the model. And directly you will have all the necessary data to run after the Comokit model. But sometimes, uh, oh, sorry, so another one, oh, this is one. But sometimes you don't, have, if you're working, for instance, in Vietnam, you don't have uh, OpenStreetMap data for, for your area. You have no information about buildings uh, in OpenStreetMap for Vietnam, for instance. And, uh, but uh, you need, for, you want to apply Comokit in Vietnam, you need to have at least buildings. Uh, so it's for that that uh, I also allow in these uh, models to uh, directly download the Google Map data uh, from the extension of the area and directly uh, vectorize uh, all the building information. So like this, you can directly download all the building that you can get inside the, 
the, the, the, the, the, the, the Google Map data. So it can uh, be, I think it's very useful. And uh, of course, it's not, uh, I, it can be useful for other models than just community. Of course, we we'll work with uh, Kevin on the generation of census population. So we will not speak about it uh, right now. The last thing that I wanted to speak about is that, uh, as you see here, um, if you want to apply this model, uh, the first thing that you have is to parameterize the model, to uh, modify the model by uh, defining what is the path of, of your shape file by defining some parameters. And uh, to do that automatically, um, so I define, so it's something new in the, 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 the version of 182, is to be able to define wizard. So now uh, it's like your user input, but for, for wizard, so you can define uh, with just simple function wizard like this one, with several pages if necessary, and uh, that uh, allow a model after a user of the model to uh, uh, define the parameter that will be used for the simulation, for instance. So also it's all that's what I wanted to speak about during this presentation. Ah, yeah, it was, so it's used, as I said, uh, Already, the, the Comic project is used already uh, for I mean for this part for this uh, part of generation of environment for the switch project, and I plan to uh, to add it to the escape project as well. So to conclude, so for Comic buildings, there's still a lot of work to do, but uh, just uh, by just raising uh, Proximix and uh, Comic I was able to in a few hours to build this model. So it's I think quite nice, and it's proved that. Sometimes uh, raising existing models can be very efficient if you want to develop a new model adapted to your case study. And uh, after except that, uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, is, uh, sometimes we are working on projects like in Comokit, and it can may lead to, to the development of tools that can, can be useful for other projects, like uh, the Prestian skills, uh, the environment generation with and so on. So, so in some time, so yeah. What did you say? Oh, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we got a some. Uh, we got a few questions on the chat, so let's maybe. Uh, um, uh, the last one is from uh, a question from Slack to Doctor Kim from models on Comotit. For example, those measuring the probability of getting infected. How can results be validated in this case? From Aya Badawi. So, are you here? See on Kim? Oh, is this question to me? <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, for the calibration, we will use a number of hospitalizations and number of deaths as a result of the, the parameters in, 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 in infection uh, probability functions. So I'm, I'm wondering what do, you, what do you mean by validation? Yeah, uh, actually, how can results be validated in this case? Uh, I think it's uh, maybe more general for models on Comokit, maybe for all those who, who spoke. I had uh, some kind of... Uh, 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 actually, I was uh, going to ask you a question about calibration uh, to, I think, almost everybody in this session, because you've got a lot of uh, processes, you've got a lot of um, parameters, and uh, I don't know some of them, it seems quite easy to find uh, some values, some data, and for others, it seems very difficult. So how do you calibrate? How do you validate? How do you do this? Separately, do you trust other studies in order to use uh, parameters? So I think for medical parameters, you use uh, medical studies for that, but uh, okay. So one of you want to answer that question? Um, I, can, I can speak with relation to the, the individual level models I described. And in that case, I work with mm -hmm. maximum likelihood estimation to try to fit the observed data and then apply some methodologies to, to calculate the confidence intervals for those estimates. Um, but again, that's, um, I would say it's ongoing work and I, I think it needs more uh, refinement in terms of validation, definitely. Yeah. 
Well, I don't know if I, uh, I think compared to the other presentation today, you may have less parameters than the others. I think you, you got some kind of aggregated parameters or. Yes, well, it, I would say that the model I presented is more of a toy model to evaluate the, mm -hmm. the approach where I define this very simplified transmission and susceptibility functions. And um, yeah, it definitely needs a, I would need to consider more complex models. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Okay, so we got an answer from, uh, okay, so let me just, uh, since there was another question before. Uh, okay, a question from Benoit. Uh, will the new pedestrian modular enough to use another algorithm, rather than uh, SFM? Uh, yeah, it's quite easy to use, uh, it depends, but, um... At the beginning of the displacement skills, I use I, I let the possibility to use two algorithms for avoidance of other agents. Uh, but the other one was not very efficient. So finally, in the final version, I just get uh, one uh, of the algorithm. But I mean, it it's was de it was designed to be quite easy to change this part of the of the placement skills. So it's quite easy. You can change just this part of the displacement skills. So yes. So you can, uh, if you if you don't like this uh, uh, this model, uh, you can sh choose another one. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Not. I've got uh, a final question. So uh, during this session, we saw uh, several uh, people using Comorkit and using uh, some. Uh, Plugins or one plugin or another. We saw Albatros. We see, I don't know if region is exactly a plugin or not. We saw Proximix. So, how do you, um, how are you aware of uh, all the plugins that are developed uh, or used with Comokit? Do you, do you talk with each other? Do you exchange? Uh, how does it work? Huh. Difficult question. No, uh, because we are waiting for Alexi. But, uh... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, actually, we we don't track people who use Como Kits. I, I wanted to before answering to go to the GitHub and see how many people had forked the the models. I think it's quite quite a, quite a number of people. Um, so we don't track people, and but of course we we answer questions. So uh, a lot of questions have been uh, most of the questions actually have taken the channel of the Google Group Gamma Google Group, okay, uh, and sometimes direct interactions with um, the, the most active developers on Comokit, which who are uh, right now Kevin, uh, Kevin Kevin Chapuis, Patrick also. Uh, so I, th there is no uh, building of a library. Uh, yeah, there is no centralized summary of uh, plugins. Not, no, no, not yet. And, and I think it, it, uh, at some point it can make sense if uh, all, the, all the different uh, approaches, for example, reach a certain level of uh, stability and mm -hmm. reusability also. Uh, so not stick to we we don't have I, I think it's it wouldn't be very interesting if we made uh, for example a, a kind of catalog of all the applications that have been made without changing the model but just by changing the data sets mm -hmm. so I, I don't think it's really really useful so there are things for example in albatross probably there are a number of things but we need to take a little bit time of time to to abstract things and maybe to, to, to see what is reusable, uh, what can be reused, uh, and maybe in that case shared with others. But right now, I, I don't know, Patrick, if you want to comment on this, but we, we did not have a specific policy on tracking people doing, uh, tra tracking and tracing people doing uh, COVID-19 models on Comokit. Oh, 
I think the idea is to that people can take some parts of Comicrit for their own models. Uh, for instance, is what I've done for Proximix, I just take some part of Proximix for for Comicrit. I think it's a, it's a good way of doing things. Okay, so I can see from Arthur, fourteen faults so far. Okay, and maybe okay, we've got a question. Maybe the last one. Uh, Patrick, you said that we can upload Google Map data on Gamma. Is there any documentation about it? Is this plugin or an enhancement of Gamma? When the buildings are created, since to a picture, it is transformed into polygons. Uh, yeah, is it transformed into polygons? So I just vectorized the image from Google Map. Uh, it's not a plugin, it's just a model in Gamma. So it's so uh, for the moment, so what I plan to do in the future is to uh, add this model to the library. Like this, people will be able to, to use it. Uh, just I need to make it more generic. And uh, for Google Maps, the only issue with Google Map data is that uh, you are supposed to have a key to access to the map. Uh, 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 yeah, is it like, is it is it uh, maybe or not? You, I mean, uh, the way I accessing the data. Um, maybe you can be banned if you use it too much, but it's maybe legal, I don't know. Uh, but maybe I will uh, add it a legal way to access, because if you have your own key, uh, you can access to the data legal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, because of the, the policy of Google change about it. Uh, some years ago, it was possible to access directly like this uh, without the key. Now you need, you, you need a key. But there is some back uh, way to, to access to the data but, uh, that I'm using, but uh, it's, it's at your own responsibility. OK, uh, OK. OK, so I think we'll end this session now. Uh, Thanks again for uh, the very interesting talks we had for this last session. Uh, and I think uh, that we see each other next year for uh, Gamma Days 2022. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> um, Patrick, you want to say some words? Uh, no, uh, not particularly. I know that you are very good at uh, just. Oh yeah, at concluding. I have concluding yet. Thank you. No, so um, well, actually, what, what I wanted to say, we we are still twenty nine person. I don't know how many of, of you are sleeping, but uh, we are still twenty nine person. On, on a, uh, it has been first quite impressive to have relatively steadily during the three days between uh, 29, so it's probably the, the, the minimum number we had, and uh, 45 people uh, for all the sessions. So really, really impressive. Um, I, I think, uh, and I will repeat myself a little bit, my first impression is uh, uh, really, first, um, uh, I am really puzzled by the diversity of what we've seen during the three days and the number of uh, applications you, you, you have uh, um, used Gamma in. Uh, it's really impressive. I'm also uh, impressed, and especially the last day today, uh, about how Gamma have been, you have been able to, to use it within an ecosystem of different softwares. Uh, and how basically it has found a place in uh, in software chains, uh, chain tools, uh, tool chains. Sorry, uh, and um, I for for me it's really um, a proof of uh, maturity of the platform. Uh, the fact that it can be used now. So of course it can be improved, and there is absolutely no doubt about it. We had uh, some criticism, uh, not too much, but probably because people were very polite. Um, uh, we, we know from the different sessions uh, and different questions uh, uh, in, in the chat, but also on Google Group, etc. we know that there are things we, we need to improve. And, and probably what comes first is the documentation. Okay. The documentation of everything, operators, uh, skills. Uh, uh, they, uh, again, wh what I said the first day is true. I, I mean, there are 
there are parts of gamma I I don't know how to use if I look at the documentation myself. Okay, uh, so I need to go to the code to understand what, what it's doing, and and so what is the meaning? And and actually, uh, we we need to move from a descriptive doc documentation, well, the the kind of thing we have now, to an operational documentation, something that can explain what happens when we change something. Um, so we've heard that, and I think uh, we will put some effort to, to improve things, probably ask you in return uh, first to identify the flows, but also to maybe um, provide some help, okay? So the documentation can be, uh, it's open. Uh, you have the possibility to uh, just change it, whether in the code or on the, on the website, to change the pages, etc. It's quite well documented how to do it. So, so please do it if you find things and if you, even if you have questions or comments. Okay. Um, so that's the first point. I think documentation is the key here. If we want Gamma to be more adopted, then of course there are a number of technical things, there are a number of uh, improvements we can make in, in many different on many different points. I heard about the speed of uh, simulation. I heard about. Um, uh, the possibility to communicate more easily with the platform from outside. I heard about, and, and we've heard that all, all the people we, we develop in a way or another uh, tools within Gamma. We will try to come back uh, with realizations, of course, but also with uh, maybe discussions. Okay. Uh, so it will take a little bit time because we need to organize also all these different things. And what I propose is that we, we try to maintain these uh, community discussion either on the Google group or on GitHub or by keeping the, the Slack group for a while, okay? Uh, so that uh, we, we can discuss and, and maybe test some ideas or some proposal, proposals. What I would like immediately, and we will probably finish on that, is that if anyone wants to speak uh, we, I would be interested in discussing about what we are going to do next year. Are we going to organize the same uh, event? Are we going to organize it, but in a little uh, slightly different way? Uh, do you have ideas about uh, what uh, should be or could be organized and how we should organize it? So if you have uh, any thing to say. Uh, I'm, look, I'm looking at the chat to see there are proposals, but not. <laughs> um, so please, uh, well, please take the floor and, and, and tell your ideas. Don't be shy. So who wants to, who wants to say something? I mentioned one thing in the chat about events for new users. I think the documentation is very important in getting people to know how to use it. Sometimes something that is more of a workshop kind of format could be very helpful. I'm new to the, to, to, to be, uh, I have to dis fully disclaim that I'm new to, to Gamma and I found it kind of by myself and started using it. And I don't know if you have done workshops in the past uh, mm. or you're going to, you know. Yeah. I think de definitely, and, and this is, uh, we, we talked about it briefly yesterday. Um, I think that having regular sessions like the ones we, we did this year, uh, quite classical sessions with people presenting their work, et cetera, et cetera, in thematic um, sessions. So it's one thing, and it's really important to have that, to, to be able to recognize also that, uh, well, other people are working on similar uh, problems and, and there is a way to exchange and share things. But it should be combined in a way or another with more uh, hands-on practical sessions about some of the techniques um, we, 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 we talked about. Uh, even for us, actually, uh, even for me, it has been quite frustrating to hear about things and just see one minute, two minutes videos, but without the possibility to, to test it, okay? 
Um, so for developers, we have coding camps. Uh, so we can't organize a coding camp, of course, with, uh, with anyone. You need to be a little bit skilled in programming. But there are uh, proposals about workshops, uh, hackathon, et cetera, et cetera. So things that would allow people uh, maybe to work either on one specific uh, skill or plugin to, to understand with the developer how to use it. That would be perfect. And maybe to document it at the same time. Uh, also, maybe on one subject, for example, having hackathon, if I, if I understand uh, uh, correctly, AYA, uh, having uh, so a number of people gathering around a problem. And hopefully, next year, we'll be able to use Gamma in the cloud to do this kind of thing if we are still, uh, and probably we, we, we will remain partially, um, partially uh, online. Okay. Uh, I see there is one. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to say something, sir. OK. Yes, thank you. I'm very happy to participate for the International Gamma Days. As I've said before, I'm Cameroonian. At, uh, I'm PhD doctor in Yaoundé, Cameroon. I'm very happy to contribute. And uh, next time or next year, I will do my best to bring more some things or to develop a, a plugin. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Arno, you want to say something? <clears throat> um, yeah, I know some few comments about the, the potential next one. Um, I think, I mean, this one was online, uh, we know why, but at the end, what was pretty crazy is that uh, we had so many people uh, like all around the world. So I'm not sure we would have met all of these people in the in a physical room. So I guess the next one should be a kind of hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, mix of uh, some physical uh, talk, some people in physical place. But I think we have to admit that at the end, this Zoom, uh, I mean, yeah, I spent three days in front of my screen. I don't know if I would have spent three days uh, listening to talk uh, physically. So I think we can think a bit about that. And um, do we have to wait for one year to do a Gamma Days? That's also an open question, maybe a smaller a smaller event with some, uh, some update could be uh, something uh, also to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the organizer will be like, come on, we cannot do that uh, every six months, but maybe a kind of hybrid stuff uh, with some update or some stuff like that uh, to be explored. Well, I, I think, uh, for, for example, because uh, Srirama is asking in the chat, do we have the one more thing thing? No, there is no one more thing. <laughs> but uh, but yes, the next version will be out, uh, I hope, not too, not too late. Uh, it's mandatory in, in any case. What, 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 I, what I propose is that when it is out and, and maybe one month or two months after, uh, we organize something around it. So having some presentations of work like we did, but also uh, maybe a presentation of the new version, what's new inside, how to use the different plugins, how, uh, how to use the different uh, facilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It couldn't be too bad huh, to have a kind of public presentation by the, the main developers of uh, what's inside the new version. Okay, and and maybe the practical problems will go from one to, to one version to, to the other. So I'm. This is something probably in a few months we can uh, we can we can organize. Uh, I see, uh, so Benoit, which who proposes to have regular monthly Gamma seminar. So I know he's organizing this in French uh, with, his, uh, with a number of PhD students in France. Uh, in that case, why not? And we could perfectly have a kind of PhD uh, seminar around Gamma, or PhD or postdoc seminar around Gamma uh, quite regularly. Uh, I, I guess he... Benoit is a good volunteer for doing this kind of thing. Um, okay, other suggestions about the, the format of the event, about uh, the animation of the event, about uh, uh, a 
what you would like maybe to see or, or, or maybe what you dislike in, in this event? I mean, again, it's also a lot of organization that there is this abstract uh, PDF where we can contact uh, everyone and have a, and have a short description. Um, for next one, uh, like publishing some paper would be great, even though it's uh, more work for the presenter and a lot of work for the, but I mean, to keep a kind of uh, academic uh, trace of the, the event, that could be something we can think about like publishing something. Yeah, um, it, it is also something we can decentralize a little bit. I mean, for example, uh, given the sessions we had uh, today, and th this, these three days, uh, there were really interesting papers, uh, really top-notch papers and, and things I, I discovered during the three days. I'm very happy about that. Um, we, If someone wants to volunteer actually to for example, organize a special session of a, of a journal, okay? Uh, it could be a jazz or something like this on a sm subset of the best papers and the ones uh, who want to write something, okay? Uh, well, that, that, that would be an idea. Uh, it is something we, 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 we have thought about uh, before uh, organizing these, these days and well, we, we did not really follow on, but, but I think it is, uh, Clearly, something we can we can think about, and if someone wants to organize this, uh, actually, it's perfectly open. Okay, every six months, so, so we we have uh, everything from uh, every one month to every two years. Okay, so probably we will do some kind of. Uh, of uh, survey uh, among the... So there, there, there are two, two things. We will come back to you by mail. Uh, so please uh, try to not put directly to trash the easy chair mail because it will go through the easy chair uh, uh, interface. We will contact you about uh, whether or not to accept that uh, the video, uh, the YouTube video, which was in run, run in parallel uh, from uh, from uh, Zoom here, but you accept that it uh, it remains uh, on YouTube on the Gamma channel uh, with you, okay? O otherwise, we will cut you. So for so the ones who presented uh, things, so we will come back to you, ask for your formal permission, and also uh, propose you to share your slides. Uh, so there will be a, a form uh, with all the, the credits, etc., etc. So you can upload the, upload your your slides, and then we will we will share them probably on the on the Gamma website on a special dedicated page. Okay. So again, it's not mandatory, but I think it would be nice if you have the possibility to share them, of course. Uh, but it would be nice if we can do it. So we will come back by mail uh, to you uh, about these two points. No, next week. Probably. Okay, so uh, may I propose that everyone turns on his or her camera so that we can make with the uh, survivors of the three days, we can make a group photo. Uh, okay, so we have uh, Well, it allows to see who's sleeping and who's not. Okay. Uh, number of sleepers is actually quite low. Um, so we still have Aya and Yakuba. If you can turn on your camera and uh, me as well, because we have your, your picture, but not your live picture. Okay, so let's already take one like this and um, another one to be sure that everybody is smiling. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I think this is the end of these exciting days. I would like just to finish by thanking a lot, uh, Patrick, 
who uh, actually was the main organizer of these three days. Okay, he did all the hard job, and we only uh, 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 helped him a little bit. So, Patrick, thank you very much. Uh, Nicola, for the technical aspects, was uh, quite unbelievable. <laughs> I think he managed, I don't know how many screens in parallel. <laughs> thank you a lot. And all the all the other ones in the admin section of the of the Slack. Uh, thanks a lot for the nice discussions as well. So have a very good uh, day, afternoon, morning, afternoon, night for the Asian ones. And uh, thanks again for your participation to these uh, Gamma days. And uh, see you for the next uh, uh, next edition. Bye bye.